And what was your PhD uh, di thing dissertation on? Uh, vermicompost. Right. What did it have? Suppression. A, a... Pythium suppression. <laughs> so All uh, right. suppression of plant diseases. Yeah. Got it. All right. Well, everybody, uh, we are live for our day of vermicompost. Uh, that is me, Peter Severi, and I am joined by Allison Jack, who has promised me that she will talk for at least two hours <laughs> uninterrupted on uh, what, what was your, what did you say your PhD uh, dissertation was? It was pithy. So uh, yeah, we were looking at pythium suppression with vermicompost. And then I also did a project for my master's uh, that included vermicompost as well, looking at rhizosphere microbial communities. And where was this at? Which fine institution got your uh, brain power? Oh, uh, so master's in soil science um, in the, well, all the departments have shifted around now, but uh, crops and soils at Cornell and then PhD in plant pathology uh, at what was formerly the uh, plant, oh, PPPMB, they changed the name a lot, plant pathology at Cornell, now part of the larger integrated plant science unit. Got it. And 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 who was your mentor, the person you looked up to as a a a worm uh, whisperer? A worm whisperer. So my mentor for my PhD uh, was Dr. Eric Nelson, and he has been working with the concept of disease suppressive compost for quite a while. He is now retired, um, and yeah, contributed a lot to this field. So. When I, I finished my undergrad, um, I went to read for undergrad and um, worked in, uh, did my, my senior thesis in a plant physiology lab. And I was very interested in like old growth forests and like canopy biology. Um, but I, I took an AmeriCorps position after undergrad um, at a special focus environmental science middle school in Portland, Oregon. I was asked to run their vermicomposting system for the middle school and then design curriculum, science curriculum around uh, the vermicomposting for their science teacher. So it, like, it didn't take long for me to get completely obsessed. So all of my background in plant science, all, and I remember, man, I think I made fun of the soil scientists when I was on a study abroad. I'm like, why would you want to dig a hole and like hang out in the hole in the ground? But uh yeah, uh, I became a soil scientist. It, it, uh, it wrote me in. So I, uh, AmeriCorps had a small stipend for conferences, and there just happened to be, it was like earthworms and ecotechnology or something in the year 2000, uh, right in Portland. Um, so AmeriCorps paid for me to attend that conference. I met Mary Applehoff. I met Peter Bogdanov. Um, I met Clive Edwards. I saw them all speak. I was really blown away. And, and so what I wanted to do for grad school then after my two year stint in AmeriCorps was like my, my singular obsession was to understand how the microbes in vermicompost could protect plants from disease. And then that's exactly what I did. So um, yeah, so then I, uh, I started my master's in Janice T's lab in, uh, at Cornell. And we looked at, um, it was a cool project. We looked at tomato transplants um, and we collaborated with Anu Rangarajan in the horticulture department who was doing a lot and still is uh, doing a ton of stuff with uh, certified organic agriculture in kind of the vegetable and horticulture space. So she um, had been really inspired by John Birnbaum at, uh, I think he was at Minnesota um, and he was looking at some kind of innovative things that you can put with potting mix for nutrient management in certified organic systems. So he was doing stuff with alfalfa meal, sesame meal, different kinds of compost, different mixtures and blends of things. So we, um, we evaluated uh, some of his recipes and some other types of recipes um, and then worked with a local vermicomposter in New York State um, and evaluated some of his material too. So we were looking at basically how, uh, how your choice of organic amendment in the potting mix actually influences the, the rhizosphere microbial community for the life of the plant. So 
um, at the time there had been a lot of studies looking at, okay, if you, if you add this compost to soil, you change the overall soil community. Or if you add this compost amendment to a potting mix, you know, you change the, the potting mix community and maybe you change the root, the, the rhizosphere community. But not at the time, nobody had really said, okay, if I pick this compost for the potting mix, does it influence the community in the root zone for the entire life cycle of the plant, even after it's been transplanted out into the soil? And that is what we found um, is that uh, uh, it, it, it does influence the microbial community in the rhizosphere for the almost the entire life cycle. I think we stopped seeing community differences around like August, September. Um, so yeah, we did a fun project uh, there. That was actually the first project, uh, the first year that the Freeville Certified Organic Research Farm at Cornell was operational after they transitioned to organic. So that was a really fun project. Um, and then I did kind of a side project on, I, I worked a little bit. So Eric Nelson was my minor advisor during my master's and I did uh, a little bit of work with Pythium. And so I kind of fell in love with that pathogen and I, I realized that uh, I like to kill things. <laughs> so I, I transitioned um, to the plant pathology department and continued working with vermicompost um, and then uh, looking at how it can protect plants from disease, specifically how the seed colonizing microbial community can, can influence um, you know, the fate of whether a pathogen can actually cause disease or not. So, um, but yeah, looking back on it, I, I do feel really lucky that, that uh, I had that early conference. You know, I, I often wonder <laughs> where I would have ended up had I, had I not, uh, you know, been asked to run a vermicomposting unit uh, at the middle school and then had the opportunity to go to that conference and, and hear from some of the national leaders in that space. Um, Again, I think I lost my autographed copy of Mary Applehoff's book, which I'm very sad about, but uh, yeah. Got it. Well, can, can you, all right. So, so I, I want to do two things. One, you're, you're kind of like our master of ceremonies for this. Uh, you're, you're shepherding us through what you think uh, kind of the, re well, we, we wanted to bring three constituents together. One was researchers, typically from academic institutions who are researching vermicompost. Mm -hmm. One was commercial producers of vermicompost product at scale. And one is uh, the end user of yeah. all of this research and product, which is the farmers. Uh, so we're going to hopefully have all of them on today. Uh, we, we pulled this together on the fly, so everybody bear with us. Uh, we have some people who couldn't make it today, other people who will be jumping on that we didn't expect. Um, so I think two things. One, maybe initially, if you want to, and I know later on we're going to have an even deeper dive, because I think the history of vermicompost is interesting. Like, it it hasn't been practiced in Europe and America for centuries, correct? Yeah, so I, I was actually just looking at my old book chapter that was part of my, uh, like my literature review for my master's um, ended up in, uh, I remember what the title of the book was, a really cool book, um, Biological Approaches to Soil Fertility, uh, like an academic kind of uh, collaboration of, of cool chapters about like all of these different biological approaches to soil. So, you know, in my reading and study, like I came across, you know, if you follow Rodale, like back to, I think one of the earliest mentions was 1960 in some of his books about earthworm, uh, earthworm farming and earthworm composting. Um, also, if you follow, you know, some of the people who influenced Rodale, like Sir Albert Howard, um, they talk about composting, but I don't think I could find any mentions in his writing of specifically worm composting. Um, but I did in that chapter, I did a couple of case studies. Um, I found, you know, there's a lot from India, like a, a lot. Um, also Cuba, also Australia, um, in terms of kind of people revitalizing this traditional technique and, and using it in, in modern farming, both small scale and large scale. 
Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of the a lot of the early systems were more like a pit, you know, like digging a trench and kind of having all of the manure in there with the worms and um, doing everything with, you know, lots of manual labor and lots of kind of manually separating the worms back out of the compost. Uh, but one of the major early innovations was, of course, with Clive Edwards. Um, he was at the time working at the Rothamsted Experiment Station uh, in the UK. And he developed what's called a continuous flow reactor. Um, so that was kind of a, a critical engineering advance that allowed vermicomposting to be uh, explored on, on a, a, a large scale commercial level. Um, because before, you know, you can do large scale commercial composting, you can use front end loaders and mixers and there's all this equipment available. Um, but at the time in like the 60s and 70s and 80s, there wasn't, there wasn't really a good way to do vermicomposting at scale. And of course, I hope, I hope that we can hear a lot more about this, you know, uh, for some of the folks that couldn't join us today, we're, we're planning some follow on sessions. So stay tuned for those and, you know, pick the brains of some, some agricultural engineers and people who've been involved in taking that model and, um, and improving upon it and kind of expanding it and, you know, building facilities, all of that. So what was unique about the continuous flow reactor is um, it has like a hopper on the top that, that travels back and forth and feeds a thin layer of manure on the top. Um, and then it has like a breaker bar on the bottom of a long bed and the breaker bar can harvest like an inch or two at a time. And then if you get the thing going and it's managed well, the earthworms, that's why it's called continuous flow, you're flowing the material through top to bottom. And the earthworms, um, you know, they have really good, you know, they don't have eyes, but they got great chemical, <laughs> chemical senses, like they, they travel upward, the new food source. So it's almost like a treadmill for worms where you're adding material from the top, they're moving into the new material at the top, and then you're taking the finished material out the bottom. And that way it removes all that manual labor of, you know, if you've, if you've ever had a worm bin at home, you're like, great, it looks like it's ready to use. Ah, I got to pick all the worms out of it. Or, you know, like Mary Applehoff's method where you make little piles and put a light and try and scare the worms down to the bottom where it gets, you know, a little dry on the edges. Like it's, it's, it's really, if, if you've experienced it all as a home vermicomposter, you're like, ah, oh, how does this scale up to a commercial scale? And, and the answer really is that, that critical early um, innovative uh, kind of breakthrough on the engineering side of this idea of the continuous flow reactor. And, you know, Clive, Clive Edwards wrote a ton of books on this. Like, um, so yeah, the check your local like extension, uh, you know, uh, any kind of, a, a lot of the, yeah, a lot of the public universities will actually uh, allow like anyone into their library. So don't be shy, um, maybe post pandemic to kind of knock on the door and say, hi, like I live in this area, you know, you're a public university, like do you have public accounts um, for, for people that aren't students but are just residents? Because Cornell had that, like if you lived in New York State, you could get a library card there and, and you could dive as deep as you wanted in, into all of those archives. So um, yeah, Clive's books are great. Uh, I think his most recent book was just a couple of years ago. Um, at, at age 91. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I got to, well, and prolific, so, uh... like, so meeting Clive in, in Portland and seeing him talk when I was like very young, it, it was so wonderful. Like, um, he and I both spoke at um, one of Rhonda Sherman's uh, vermicompost conferences. She does an annual workshop, which huge shout out, like if you wanna learn more about production and use of vermicompost, those are just amazing conferences. She pulls together people from all over the world and puts together a great program. Everyone gives research updates. Um, so it was really fun to, you know, be in the audience and see Clive give a talk and then years later actually, you know, be on the same speaker docket as him at, at one of Rhonda's vermicompost workshops, so. So he's like the Beatles of the, uh, yeah. <laughs> of the vermicompost world and, and who's the Rolling Stones? Oh gosh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> There, yeah, you know, there's there's a lot of uh, great personalities in in this industry and in and in this research space. So yeah, it's uh, it's a lot of fun. So. Got it. So 
Um, how how deep a dive? Because I I was firing off emails as you were talking. Have we gone into kind of India and its place in vermicompost history? Yeah, I mentioned it briefly, and I'm hoping. Um, I think if if Norma Aaron Cohn comes on today, or maybe in the next couple of days, like if we do a follow on session with him, I I couldn't remember what his schedule was. Well, Steve, Steve also went on one of those trips. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah, because I know through Tom Herlihy that there were oh, maybe three or four um, State Department sponsored trips to India for like learning about vermicompost technology in India, kind of as a as a technology transfer exchange between the two countries um, that were arranged like at the State Department, like <laughs> diplomats and stuff. Uh, so yeah, I haven't been on any of those trips, but if we can pick anyone's brain who's been on one, they can probably speak more to you know the history of that technology in India. But really, India is a is a global leader in this technology, both the the development of it as a traditional agricultural technique, but then also the expansion into larger scale, commercial scale, and different kinds of uses of the finished material, and a lot of that um, kind of applied research as well. I know, you know, trying to do a master's and learn about vermicompost in, in 2002, uh, a lot of the papers, and, you know, I'm reading the Indian Journal of Agronomy and all this because they were really some of the first people to, to publish about it um, in, in the scientific community and get people excited about it. So. Well, with the caveat that you have not been there, can you, can you elaborate on what you know about kind of the history of vermicomposting in India and, you know, the commercialization of it? Oh, uh, I like, uh, we're probably going to have to punt that one to Norm when he's on, right. like, um, I'm literally like, I'm like, hmm, looking at things I wrote in 2005 to try and remember, because <laughs> for me, it's, it's been a bit. Well, well how, how about fresher in the memory? Because uh, yeah. you, you have been reading a lot lately. Uh, we're going to take a, a 10 minute detour from vermicompost and talk about composting methodologies in human history, which you have done a deep dive into. Oh, yeah. And can you yeah, talk so about some, some funny, interesting Thing, things that um, things that people have done <laughs> in the effort to compost. Yeah, I I love that kind of well because you'll you'll see it in a book, right? I think like in some of Rodale's books, um, he'll say, oh, you know, the ancient Romans wrote about con compost. You're like, okay, well, well, where? And they say, you know, Cato wrote about it. You're like, all right, well, I guess that's the Dia Agricole or whatever his treatise was on agriculture. So. I am exactly the kind of nerd that then finds a translation of that in the library and then tries to, okay, well, where really did they mention it and what really were they talking about? So um, I, I was I was thrilled to learn about this amazing book um, by Zadox. Um, I think it's uh, Crop Protection in Medieval Agriculture is the title of the book. And we can send that out like in a resource list. It's amazing. Like he, he was, you know, a, a plant pathologist for his entire career, um, developed one of the wheat uh, developmental stage, um, uh, like systems is actually named after him. So very accomplished scientist, but in his later years went through all of the deep archives um, in Europe and it, through translation and found all of the mentions of how ancient actually helped you know, uh, control and, and mitigate uh, crop diseases. So some of them are amazing where some ancient Arabic texts talk about, you know, excavating, like if your almond tree gets sick, excavating part of the root system, adding sulfur, which of course, like is still used <laughs> for pest protection and, you know, fermented human, uh, human waste, human solid waste adding that, like caking it onto the roots and then reburying the roots. And, you know, of course, some of the things were like, oh, if you want to protect your almond orchard from a hailstorm, you stick a turtle upside down on his back, like there at night, and then it won't hail on your almond trees. So some of those, you're like, well, we probably maybe that one like didn't help as much as rubbing sulfur on the roots. Um, but there are, you know, if, you, if you're interested in that angle, that, that one book by Zadox is amazing. He did a comprehensive look through all available medieval texts um, to see 
you know, what types of things people did um, to, to control uh, crop diseases. Um, and I was thinking of another one there. Um, so, so what, what were, you had just mentioned the sulfur, but like, you know, what were some of the things that a thousand, you know, 500 years, a thousand years ago, 2000 years ago that th they actually surprisingly got right and just had that understanding like that science could 2000 years or 500 years later prove, um, can you give some examples of that? Yeah, so the, the sulfur one, obviously, like that's literally still in use and in use in, in organic egg. Um, uh, and then- uh, sorry, sorry, just quickly, people are asking oh, yeah. for the name of the book again. Oh yeah, uh, I think here, don't laugh, I'm gonna Google it. I think it's called Crop Protection in Medieval Agriculture. Let me check. It is like, it will blow your mind. It is so comprehensive. Um, and I've moved like seven times. So I'm sure it's in one of those boxes over there, but I don't. Yeah, I, I, I found I it. I'll, uh, yeah, yeah let crop protection in medieval ag. Yeah, let me, I will show everybody an image of it in a second. But uh, yeah, yeah, I found it. Yeah, it's fantastic. Crop protection in medieval agriculture studies in pre modern organic agriculture by Jan C. Zadox. Um, and he was from Wageningen. Um, yeah, I, I got that book as a gift, a uh, parting gift from my, my short uh, international math, uh, uh, postdoc at, at Wageningen. And I was like, oh, these people really get me. This is the best book I've ever read. <laughs> and we actually, when, when I was teaching later um, at, at Prescott College, we, we used, um, we kind of went through some of the chapters as, okay, you know, which ones of these, like, obviously ancient people did a ton of interesting things, you know, how do you evaluate, like, what, oh, yeah, there it is, awesome. Yeah, so, so just quickly, this is the, uh, the book, and that's a very German-looking uh, sketch, right? Yeah, it's, it's worth finding, and it's worth asking your library to buy it if they don't have it. <laughs> Yeah, uh, librarians love me. You just bug the librarian. They'll get you stuff, and they'll interlibrary loan you stuff. Even in your public library, you just got to bug them, and they'll they'll find it for you. Um, and I'm sure that one's available online, too. Uh, yeah, so um, uh, where was I going with that? Oh, so they also wrote notes. Ancient people wrote little notes, uh, like a contract of like, hey, little gopher, like if you don't eat my crops, um, you know, like I'll give you a carrot over here, but you have to like not eat my crops. So we we did that kind of as a just a fun activity in a in a few course I was teaching. It's like, okay, you know, what would you write to to the <laughs> to the, the woodchucks or the gophers or or anything else that's eating the crops? Um, and yeah, of course we also trapped them. That was a little more helpful, but um, uh, uh, yeah. I'm trying Numbers. to think of some of those other ancient ones. Oh, oh, here's another one. And I, I do have that on my bookshelf because I'm still halfway through it. Um, uh, Farmers of 40 Centuries. And that is now, I think that's at the road in print. Um, I first read it, they had a first edition 1911 in the Cornell Library. Um, I'm like, oh, should I even be like touching this without gloves on? You just checked it out. It's like a hundred year old book. Um, so this was, oh, I'm going to forget his name. Sorry, I'm, uh, I'm going to rely heavily on uh, Mr. Google for a memory here. Uh, okay, Farmers Rice, what was his name? Um, 40 centuries. But yeah, but this one's back in, in print. Um, F.H. King, that's right. Uh, Permanent Agriculture in China, Korea, and Japan. So that book, um, it was an agronomist traveling by train um, through China, Korea, and Japan, um, taking like photos, like actually photo documenting a lot of the traditional practices, especially with night soil. And my mom lived in Japan in the 60s and she was like, yep, we, we composted our poop and they called it night soil and you like pooped in a bucket and then the bucket went into like this other place, stuff happened to it. <laughs> um, so yeah, it F. H. King goes into this really uh, like complex system of even urban and rural. So you would you would have collection systems where even in urban environments, people would be collecting human waste 
um, shipping it like by boat back to rural areas and then composting it and then adding it as a soil amendment. So I, I find that book fascinating because it's, it's an eyewitness account of like a Western agronomist going through talking with people, photographing some of these systems um, that very soon thereafter like didn't exist as much you know it was right at that time of transition and in, into more modern, modern practices so yeah that's a great book if, if people are curious about that and again that one is uh, in print in paperback uh, at the Rodale Press I believe that's where I got it got it so let 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 sorry I'm looking at the yeah, the, the chats on fire right now but uh oh, cool. yeah throw me a question anyone got questions <laughs> what was I, I I have some questions so I want to talk about like one can we do a deep dive into your research like sure. uh can you talk about kind of what you were trying to prove or disprove and kind of in a remember we're filibustering here until the rest yeah, yeah. of the panelists show up so in, in as long or as little time as it takes okay. you to to talk about your phd dissertation yeah so i mean i covered some of the stuff that i did for my master's um and yeah i can share the papers um i i think ooh, oh no i don't have a preprint of the second one up on so if 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 any of you guys are curious at like you know, getting access to papers if you're not at a research institution, but you're a really voracious reader, ResearchGate is a really good place to go. If you make a ResearchGate account, um, that's where scientists share, you know, like non-copyright uh, restricted versions of their papers and dissertations and, you know, all sorts of documents uh, are shared there among that's that's a that's a great resource if you're like I want to read everything I want to read all the things <laughs> that's a good place to go so yeah I covered um, uh, the master's project a little bit I guess um, going back to that one we did so we didn't find so again we were evaluating different types of organic amendments to potting mix uh, for nutrient management uh, for transplanted tomatoes so tomatoes that start in the greenhouse and then get transplanted out into the field and we didn't see a significant difference in total yield. But again, this is, you know, we didn't do anything different to them once they were in the field. We only started them out with a different charge of, you know, a sesame meal and alfalfa meal. I think we had some blood meal in there and different types of, of vermicompost and, and uh, traditional vermicillic compost. Um, so, but we, what we did see was uh, like a marginally significant, like P equals 0.08. Uh, difference in early early yield. So that's something, you know, learning about horticulture that, you know, overall yield is great, but also, especially for fresh market tomatoes, if, if you can get to market with fresh tomatoes, like a week or two weeks, you know, before the farm next to you, that's actually an economic benefit um, in terms of like, you know, earlier, earlier to, to ripen and earlier to yield. So we were, we were excited about that just from, you know, a, picking a different kind of amendment at the very beginning of that, of that uh, crop's life cycle. So yeah, that one was, I think, in soil biology and biochemistry. And I, I do have the preprint for that one on my research gate. Uh, I do need to add the preprint for the, the PhD project, but so yeah, so once I learned that I really like to kill things with Pythium, which is an oomycete uh, plant pathogen, um, I transitioned into the Nelson lab and went 100% into, okay, um, you know, we are going to look at how this material suppresses this disease. Because we did have some early evidence where like, huh, if you do this in a little assay and you add the zoospores, which are the, the motile propagative unit of Pythium. And that's kind of what's unique about um, some of the oospore pathogens, uh, sorry, the OMIC pathogens, is that they produce swimming zoospores that use chemotaxis to find their host in the soil. So um, they're really fun to experiment with. And we were able to develop um, a lot of different like questions and hypotheses around uh, around that system that we could go into in more detail. So um, that time actually, uh, so yeah, so we did this as a collaboration with Worm Power um, and I had met Tom Harlehy. And again, I'm really hoping to do a session with him like in the, later this week or next week. 
Um, I had met him when he was still a consulting, uh, uh, like agricultural engineer, um, designing like composting and, uh, and biosolids composting systems uh, for a consulting firm. And I think I met him at US Composting Council meeting, maybe the one in San Antonio, like 2003. Some of this is in the Wayback Machine, so I do not remember all the details. Um, but at the time, uh, Tom was looking to branch out on his own, you know, strong entrepreneurial spirit, wanted to, you know, he knew that there was a future for large scale vermicomposting in the US um, and wanted to kind of, you know, do it, <laughs> see if he could make it happen. Um, so uh, we worked with his material for my master's. That was the vermicompost material that we that we used in that project, both seasons of that project. That was like a two-year project. And then um, he and I started writing grants together with, with my PI, um, Eric Nelson, in the lab. So we uh, we sought funding from the USDA uh, SBIR program. So SBIR stands for Small Business Innovation Research. And all federal agencies have SBIR programs. And they're really to foster this idea of industry um, academia partnership, where, you know, they recognize he's a startup. He, he doesn't have the funds to like hire a scientist and build a lab and you know have a whole product development arm of the company yet right um, so it's designed to reach into the expertise at local uh, universities and do joint projects where okay like we're interested in this material and in this project um, you know like you're interested in getting some data like let's work together and let's figure out like how to um, you know develop products and to, uh, uh, most importantly in my mind, like understand how they actually work so that you can build off of that and kind of share that back with the research community. So yeah, uh, so we knew that his material was pythium suppressive. Um, we wrote a bunch of grants. We got funding from all over the place. I think our first grant was from the Organic Farming Research Foundation. We also got support from the New York Farm Viability Institute. Um, just a lot of support for, you know, green alternatives and this idea of, you know, how can you link uh, waste management with also inputs in another system, I think was really compelling to, to a lot of the funders. Um, and Tom at one point had done a back of the envelope calculation. He's like, you know, we're selling the composted dairy manure for more than the farmers actually selling the milk for on a pound per pound basis. So wow. yeah, cheeky in some of our grant title <laughs> grant titles were like, oh, when the manure is worth more than the milk, you know, adding these income streams and and developing an input for for high value horticulture. So yeah, so at the so yeah, I met him in like uh, 2002, 2003 during my master's, and then uh, he had broken ground and and started building that facility used his material for my master's, and then for the PhD, we were directly collaborating together and writing those grants together. Um, and it, two things, we had one part of the project was kind of uh, product development. Uh, we wanted to look into uh, how can we develop a liquid compost extract, and could we develop one that also had the same properties, you know, that was, that was pythium suppressive. Um, and then uh, it was really like mode of action. Okay, so now we know that this suppresses pythium. How does it work? Like, what's it doing? What is unique about this material um, that's providing like this this benefit to plants? So, for for the mode of action part of it, um, we're working with cucumber as just kind of a great model species for for pythium, and. Um, we had like the Nelson lab had pioneered some of this, this idea of the spermosphere, right? Because everyone's heard of the rhizosphere. That's you know, the, the zone of influence around the root and uh, plants usually uh, shunt about 25% of the carbon that they fix through photosynthesis. They don't even use it for their metabolism. They just slough it off out of their roots into the rhizosphere. And that really is to kind of feed their pets, right? It's to feed their symbionts and the microbes that um, can support them uh, as kind of their, their larger uh, microbiome, right? Just like we understand our gut microbiome is so important for our health. 
um, the rhizosphere microbiome is very important for plant health. And then there were a lot of researchers at the time and definitely now too, um, looking at the phylosphere, that's of course the leaf surface. Um, but I will say like not a lot of people at the time or even still uh, have focused on the spermosphere as um, one of the plant microbiome spheres. So um, Eric Nelson's lab had done a lot of kind of pioneering research in that area. He's got a great review paper um, on like every research paper ever published on, you know, seed surface microbes, um, which is, yeah, a great review if people want to check that one out. Um, and, and just the spelling of that is S-P-E-R-M-O-S-P-H-E-R-E, -E -E, right? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And I, I would always get giggles. Like, it's hard to say it with a straight face. Like, in grower talks, you're like, I work with the spermosphere. I'm like, <laughs> like, yeah. So, you know, like, it, that's what it's called. It's called the spermosphere. <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, and, and just quickly to define uh, where that is again. So, it's so all of these are kind of functional definitions, right? Like the leaf surface is pretty easy. It's like, it's the surface of the leaf and the microbes live there. Um, the, the rhizosphere zone, you know, there it, it's a functional definition. Like a lot of people in, in, in the literature will say, well, I harvested the plant. I tapped it a couple of times to take the loosely adhering soil off of it. And whatever soil was left, like we're calling that the rhizosphere soil. So the rhizoplane, which is the actual surface of the root. Um, so like none of the soil, but just the surface of the root. So it really, yeah, these are like functional definitions. Um, for the rhizosphere, a lot of it is the zone of influence as defined by those ectates, right? So the plant fixes carbon from the nitrate from the atmosphere through photosynthesis and then shunts again like 25% of that just throws it into the soil to feed all those microbes. So that's another way to functionally define it too, is like, okay, that zone of influence around the roots that is impacted, like the, the, that the microbes are actually eating those exudates and responding to those exudates. That's another way to look at it. And I think that's a good functional definition for the spermosphere as well, is um, as soon as seeds hit the soil and start to germinate and buy a ton of water, they generate a bunch of turgor pressure and that turgor pressure breaks a lot of the cells that are in the seed itself. And you just get like a bunch of exudates that come out of the seed. Um, and yeah, so that's like the functional definition of the spermosphere. And so, so, so interestingly, yeah. we, we had, um, oh God, uh, Rutgers, Dr. James White from Rutgers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and we were talking about uh, just kind of what's going on on a seed that overwinters in the ground versus yeah. like when people, um, you know, make seed packs and, uh, and, and put them in like dry barren environments. And, you know, maybe, maybe you want to throw some soil. Like we were like, wow, like yeah. if you put like a, some local native dirt in there with them, like, would they be happier and more productive when they get popped and, <laughs> six months or a year or whatever yeah the seed microbiome is still it's like it's like the forgotten microbiome <laughs> it, it's great that more people are working on it now but i really was surprised at the time it's like okay rhizosphere phylosphere, yes but like nobody's really looking at the seed and especially for seed infecting pathogens like hitting off and some of those others like seed and seedling rots uh that's where the action is right because the plant barely even has made a radical or a root before it's dead <laughs> so all of the the critical interactions that either allow to occur or prevent disease are just all on the surface of the seed got it and, and we have uh <laughs> someone just joined us who's Yay. also going to pepper you with questions and, right. well, uh, and I, uh very quickly i'm going to pop upstairs for a bio break and i'll be right back <laughs> okay all right so you so you go up and right. uh we we will morning. tell Jet we, we'll hold down the fort while uh yeah good morning, good morning. <laughs> good morning so you're just waking up yeah man I woke up just for this <laughs> yeah no I, I i so for everybody who's watched i mean these things like i put this together on the fly and 
we're going to do it today, but I think the next one's going to be epic because there are all these people who are like, ah, oh, like I can do it another day. And so what I wanted to do is to bring together kind of like people doing the research, um, you know, and then we have a bunch of commercial producers like, uh, let me go through some of the, like, uh, Christy Christy from Black Diamond Vermicompost, uh, um, D well, Doug, uh, and I don't know if you pronounce it nipple, but from Northwest Red Worms, he's jumping on later today. Uh, I he's sent an in invite I, out. I, I, oh, oh, you know him. Yeah, I, I met him. I went to Northwest, the Northwest Red Worms and picked up some castings from him. They're beautiful. Yeah, the, the Terra Vesco team, uh, Margaret Lloyd, who's their, I think, chief scientist. Uh, she's in a tomato field right now. And I was like, no, no, we're going all day. So like, <laughs> even if you even if you're if you're in the tomato field now, if like six hours from now, you're at home, like, jump on so so it's like she may jump on she may not but she'll come on another time um we have uh uh the team from biofiltro which is actually taking industrial waste uh they're in the bay or actually they're up in davis um and uh so they're doing commercial production at scale but oh my god allison that was the quickest pee break uh you're, you're faster than me and uh, so, Allison, we're gonna we're gonna go back to you. Um, what one of so, all right? So, so we we were talking about uh, the kind of microbial activity around the seeds and mm -hmm. the. So now I get why it's called the spermosphere. Uh, it's absolutely named. Um, it's not just an unfortunate coincidence. <laughs> well, I'm, like, I'm curious. Um, with cannabis seeds, they come in a. They come wrapped in what was, the like the outer coating of the ovary, mm -hmm. but then they also have a thinner membrane that we all often just refer to as like tiger stripes. Um, this will scrape off as well, and I was curious if you know anything about. Um, whether it would be smart to, to dry and store the seeds inside the, the more fleshy coat as opposed to just with the tiger straps. I wonder if there's a bacterial or fungal or any sort of microbe difference based on leaving those on versus taking those off because historically we've always taken those off. But um, Peter was mentioning he had a guest a little while ago. His name is escaping me. Oh, James White. Yeah, and, and James was talking about how the plant can transport, um, I might be quoting him incorrectly, but he was, he was talking about how he could transport bacteria and fungi from basically the root zone to the seed through the plant. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it made me curious about leaving these materials on the seeds for the health of the seed when it comes time to germinate. Um, do you know anything about that with other seeds or cannabis or anything in general? <sighs> So, so and just, I, just, just quickly, these are oh, the tiger stripes she's uh, talking about. Cool. Yeah. Um, so uh, I haven't done a lot of work on this. Um, I'm doing a little bit of actual work with cannabis seed treatment. I just haven't touched it myself like, uh, through my current position. But um, in researching for that project, uh, the Cornell Hemp team actually has some great resources online, some extension resources. They've looked at seed quality in cannabis. Um, and I think, and, and again, I, I'm not sure um, if, it's, if it's like coats on or coats off, but they found just a, like, a large fungal load of actual like fungal pathogens on the seeds. Um, where any vegetable seed industry would would like just say like oh, this is unacceptable <laughs> like this is like you you know now you're just gonna infect your whole greenhouse with like X Y Z so um, yeah uh, Dr Alan Taylor is doing some great work there um, and their extension resources are all like free and on their website so um, I would check that out and yeah now I'm curious maybe I'll maybe I'll bug him and ask him but. Uh, like if, if the seeds that he was working with for that study had been stored with the coat on or with the coat off, 
Um, but certainly like, yeah, he's, he's working on developing like kind of standards for seed quality within the cannabis industry to, to help with some of that kind of stuff. Cause again, the seeds are expensive and any loss of germination is like, whew, uh, <laughs> is rough. So, yeah. so that was Dr. Alan Taylor at Cornell. At Cornell, yeah. And if you just Google the Cornell hemp team, uh, I know they're doing some stuff with powdery mildew. Uh, Dr. Taylor is doing work um, on seed quality and, and uh, you know, even size grading. You know, most vegetable seed companies will just like grade out the size. Like he was, I think some of the batches that they were looking at in, in the PowerPoint deck that's available on their website were like 50% germination, 60% germination. And that's like... That, that needs work <laughs> for yeah. sure but then figuring out exactly how um is a whole other thing um i do know from a seed treatment perspective like trying to put a biological on them that kind of waxy coat is a little bit more complicated than something simple like a soy seed um so yeah like sorghum i believe also has a, like like similar physical properties like there's they're small seeds and then they're kind of waxy which is is hard to get living microbes on there in a stable way so that's very interesting thank you we lost peter <laughs> yeah he's probably doing a bio break too awesome <laughs> i guess he's allowed to if he streams all day <laughs> yeah oh there he is i'm back cool. um so well so one thing I thought was interesting when we spoke a while ago was uh, can you talk about how kind of the hot compost community views the vermicompost community? Like all of us, like you're in the middle of it and all of us, it's like almost like high school clicks, right? Right. <laughs> so can you talk about the different factions in the compost community and who looks down on whom and... Well, so again, like, uh, I've been out of the world for like, uh, like seven, seven, eight years. So I, I don't have like the, the most like up to date knowledge. So just with that caveat. Um, but like I talked about in the intro, right, like, we've been able to do commercial scale composting for quite a while, like the earliest tractors and front end loaders, and then like early mixing equipment. So there's been the engineering advances to support large scale composting for a while. Um, and then with that comes like the whole industry and industry associations and equipment manufacturers and like quality standards for how you make it and how do you, how do you measure what that quality is and how do people use it? Um, and because vermicompost was later to the game, again, that's just my interpretation because it, it was later to the game in those engineering innovations that allowed people to do it at large scale, it's always kind of been like the weird cousin of the composting world. Um, so yeah, like you have the US Composting Council, it's a fantastic uh, like uh, uh, industry association for the composting community. Um, and you can ask Tom about this too. I think tried to do like working groups and you know, the, the problem is too that the materials, not only the process, that like that you use to make the materials are night and day different from like the vermicomposting to you know, traditional like hot composting, um, but kind of the end material is kind of different too. So I think it's been called, like there's not enough critical mass to have like a vermicomposting association. Although I know you're going to have Bentley Christie on, right? Uh, I don't, he, he's going on vacation. Oh, yeah, he's on vacation. Tomorrow. Well, so, I, so I sent him the link to be like, even if you can only jump on for 15 minutes. Yeah, if you get Bentley Christie on later, he, he's now, he's taken it upon himself to start like a warm farming alliance, kind of like a, a vermicompost only industry association where people, you know, running facilities can share tips with each other and, and do trainings. And yeah, so it'd be worth asking him about that. But I know like the main industry association for composting is the U.S. Composting Council. And I think it's always been hard to work in a process and a material that are so totally different and that are like decades behind in terms of the, the uh, like the engineering advances to do it large scale. I, I, I know that'll change within my lifetime. I know there are large scale facilities currently in operation now. So it just, it'll just take a few more to get that critical mass to really get some sort of 
industry association and like agreed upon standards for, you know, what is vermicompost and, you know, can you have like a third party seal of approval, like that kind of stuff. I'm uh, looking at, uh, so, so Jim Bennett just joined us. Uh, hey, Jim. Who's going to be on for, he's going to be part of this marathon session for the day. Um, yeah, just your video quick, scared me. I saw the timestamp on that one. It was like five hours. I'm like, oh, I don't know, Peter, like five hours is a long time. Right. <laughs> That's the minimum we go. Uh, so Cosmic Pangolin asked, can you talk about using uh, fresh coconut water to reintroduce enzymes necessary to break down the seed coat? Uh, he said, Potent Ponic Steve, he's a cannabis industry celebrity, uses this method for old seeds. Uh, and then Hetty B said, I'd rather inoculate my seeds with a quality compost extract and sterilize them. P people were talking about, I think, using UV light to kill uh, uh, pathogens, but uh, they're talking seeds since we were on the subject. I'm going to punt all of those questions to Cascadian Grown and Jim. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. Okay. Again, like I, I am working with cannabis seed treatment right now in my current role, but I, I haven't been hands-on enough um, to, to know like protocol development for that kind of stuff. So, Well, how about just with other seeds in general and kind of like what seeds are in a similar family or? Well, um, so, I mean, right now in my current role, uh, I work with uh, pink pigmented facultative methylobacteria, and uh, we call them M-trophs because that doesn't exactly roll off the tongue. Uh, PPFMs for scientists, and then we've nicknamed them M-trophs for, for just communicating about them. And uh, yeah, and again, like our, our formulations and fermentation team has taught me a lot about like, oh, you know, corn is waxier and it's it's a little bit harder to get things like alive on corn for, you know, for like a three month stability period. Like soy is pretty easy to work with. And again, we're mostly in the row crops. So I don't have a ton of hands-on experience like with, uh, with other types of seeds. Um, but I know like from, again, kind of looping back to, to my PhD project, what we were able to show is if we started cucumber seeds in vermicompost. I think it was just like 10% vermicompost mixed in with sand. And then I would transplant them. I did all these transplanting experiments. So I just started them in there, pull them out, move them to just sand, and then add the pathogen. If they, there was like a critical eight hour window, if they were in that mix for eight hours and I transplanted them somewhere else, they were fully protected from the disease. So it was literally like using them to bait out <laughs> the beneficial microbes that then could protect them. Um, and I know, and yeah, I just I just saw a note from Tom. I think we're gonna get Tom on. Uh, Tom followed up on a lot of that work after I left. Um, and he was like, well, you know, if you can dip it in the vermicompost for X amount of time, um, you know, and then it's protected from pythium, like, could you actually develop uh, a seed treatment out of that material. And they were looking at like powdered seed treatments and liquid seed treatments. And um, we did like, uh, we had a non-aerated liquid vermicompost extract that was pythium suppressive and you could freeze dry it, reconstitute it, and it was like still suppressive. So I think they were doing some stuff with those freeze dried powders of like, okay, well, if the microbes that can protect it from disease are in those powders, how could you make some sort of a seed treatment out of those? Um, but yeah, again, that was after I left the lab. So we'll, we will aggressively jump on Tom whenever he gets in here and I like ask him about that. Oh, yeah, man, yeah. Pigmented facultative methylotrophic bacteria. <gasps> methylotroph. So yeah, either pink pigmented facultative methylotrophs or methylobacteria. Yeah. I'm going to put this in the chat cause I'm sure, uh, yeah. And I'm as, hoping to join Peter, depending on how our trials go this season, I'm, I'm hoping to join Peter in the fall with some cool results um, on cannabis. Fingers crossed. Okay, so I just posted that in the chat. Um, what was I going to say? Uh, so uh, what, go ahead. Oh, yeah, just one more thing about like seed types. Um, 
when you're treating seeds, it's usually a liquid. So it, like if you're doing a liquid treatment, some seeds don't like to be re-wetted up. Like corn, if you re-wet it, like it, and it, it will dry back down, but like the germination rates will not be the same. And like soy, you have to be careful not to disturb the seed coat. Um, so yeah, each seed has its own kind of unique, you're like, this would be great if I could just get it on the surface of the seed, but then there's like the follow on, oh no, but it doesn't like being re-wetted because then the is lowered. Or um, like for corn seed treatment, if you disturb the germ, like right at the end, uh, like then there you go, like you just killed your corn seed. So um, it's, yeah. And all of that has been you know, decades of research for commercial seed treatment for these larger crops and cannabis is just now like getting that kind of research attention, um, you know, from, from, uh, from scientists, of course, like people have been developing their own stuff all the way through and hopefully scientists will like pick some of that up and, and try and expand upon it because yeah, they're all, <laughs> they're all sensitive in their own ways. And like each seed is, is totally different on how you can handle it, if you can re-wet it, all that kind of stuff. Oh, yay, Christy, Christy. Oh, Peter, you're muted. Yeah. Uh, oh, okay, good. Christy, can you hear us? I can hear you. Excellent. Welcome to the party. Thank you. So. Hi, Christy. Hi. So, so, and you got you guys met at the NC State event, right? I'm trying to remember. We emailed a lot, and um, I remember you very kindly embedded like, our, our extension video on your website. But I don't. Did I meet you at, at at one of Rhonda's conferences, or just like around in the scene? I don't remember. It's been a while. Oh my gosh! Yeah, I I don't remember either. We have been all over the place, both of us. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so just go, well, I was going to say, so just quickly, I, I think let's segue into Christy in a minute, but it, or we could start with Christy, but I, I also wanted to get into like, as somebody who's seen kind of the, or research or read a lot of the academic research of the past, let's say 50 years, what, what are some of the like the seminal findings uh, from your perspective in Vermicompost? Like I know uh, Yasmin with the um, like the anti uh, pathogen uh, stuff and like what are some of the- She was more the... like anti-insect, yeah. Sorry, anti-insect, but uh, le like, can you be like, and, and this person like discovered this, which was huge. And this person confirmed that, which was also huge. Yeah. I mean, I would definitely for insect suppression. Um, Yasmin is, is who comes to mind. And yeah, I, I met her at one of Rhonda's talks and got to tour her lab and, and talk with, um, you know, some of the people in her lab and, uh, yeah, I find I find her uh, her core of work on on the insect suppression stuff really interesting. Um, and, and so, what are the key takeaways on that topic of insect suppression? That's good. <laughs> Again, did I say I've been out of this field for like seven? <laughs> uh, read some stuff before I got back on. Um, well, I know, so she she was looking at two angles. Um, I believe she was looking at actually like isolating, I, I think she found a new species of entomopathogenic nematode, but entomopathogenic means insects. Um, and a lot of biocontrol is actually like releasing those into a greenhouse environment, you know, as like a targeted like killer for the insects that you don't want. Um, I believe she discovered a new species of entomopathogenic nematode from vermicompost and then confirmed that it uh, like could be helpful for suppressing different insect pests. Um, and then I think she was also, she did some, if I remember correctly, she was doing some interesting work on, you know, how exactly it works. Like if you have vermicompost that's touching the roots of the plants, like how is it possibly providing a benefit to like a, 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 a a leaf feeding insect, right? So how how is the how are the microbes in the vermicompost like triggering the plant's own defense system? So 
I, I'm pretty sure that was her. I remember being really inspired by some of those papers and trying to make schematics for a lot of my talks, but that idea of, you know, really how, how is the plant's own defense system being triggered by the addition of the microbes in the vermicompost? And then, um, yeah, I know uh, Clive and Norm did a lot of early work on just like proof of concept. Okay, like, can it suppress this pathogen? Can it suppress that pathogen? Um, and, uh, and again, you know, uh, Clive doing a ton of work on that continuous flow reactor kind of from the engineering standpoint. Um, there, there are a ton of really great, like there's some case studies from Columbia. I actually, I, uh, I like just opened my entire like EndNote library from, uh, from my master's, but I can, I can do like an annotated bibliography because they're, they're great case studies on just all sorts of different kinds of materials that you can use. So like, hey, you know, can you take like uh, coffee pulp, you know, waste and mix it with the chaff and then like add, you know, some manure and like, does that work? And then does it have beneficial impacts on the plant? So um, really great international studies, like case studies on different types of waste streams, different types of production systems, and then different types of uses of that kind of material. So, um, yeah, it's like, it's all in a kind of obscure journals and yeah, I'd be happy to share like a, an annotated bibliography because there's, there's, you have to look for it, but there, there is a lot of information out there um, and a lot to build off of as, as we're developing, you know, new techniques. So. Got it. So, um, Jim, you're, you're the one who, who initially mentioned black diamond vermicompost, uh, and Christy is now with us. So can, can you, can you introduce the company, uh, and, and why you respect them? Uh, this is going to sound really corny to many people, but the first thing that I look when I consider buying uh, vermicompost is, is it in a bag or do I have to bring my own bucket? And bring your own bucket is my preferred way. So when I found them online, I began promoting them as this is where you're gonna get real castings. Uh, and I've sent, I don't know, at least a hundred people over the last 10 years to go to that time, uh, San Luis Obispo was, uh, I think, part of the name, too, in Black Diamond. And not one person ever said anything other than, wow, what an experience after they used the material to grow their crops. And it wasn't all cannabis. Some of it was for market uh, farmers, like the ones that provide the food that we find when we go to a Saturday market, we'll say, in your community. Um, Many years ago, they used to be called truck farming. Now we call it market farming. But uh, yeah, there uh, Black Diamond would be one of four companies that I would buy castings from on the entire West Coast, from Mexico to Canada. The majority of products out there just are not um, well. But uh, they're just not usable, and uh, not even approaching. I started out with uh, John Holcomb's company here in Oregon City. He's the one that uh, did the development of the vertical flow through and other designs in conjunction with Dr. Edwards. So, and he developed several large uh, flow through facilities at Oregon State University and some other academic and uh, businesses uh, to process uh, material. So, but Jim, that's, what, uh, yeah, that's why your... I, uh, oh, sorry. go ahead. I'm sorry. What, what are the main things you look for? Like usability, right? You're like, okay, that is not usable. Like, what is your criteria for like, this is quality vermicompost that I want to use versus like not? Like, how do you draw that line? Growth rate, health, vigor. Um, I have a strain that's 36 years old. Uh, that's been, God, I hate using this word around scientists, but clone, you know, mother clone, mother clone, mother clone deal. And so uh, one of the advantages there is that you know what it's supposed to do. Uh, you're not, it's not grabbing some seeds and let's, we'll see what happens. That's good and bad, maybe. But uh, on the vermicompost, I really, 
I got to get down and grab a handful, put it up to my nose. I want to look at it. I want to see what the process of getting there, what materials were used, uh, manures, uh, if that's going to be it, or say it's a plant-based compost. Living here in uh, Oregon, we have that luxury. We have, I wouldn't say they're all good, but we have a lot of choices because sustainable and organic farming is an integral part of our uh, industry up here. So there's a lot of choices. Like I said, they're not all good. <clears throat> Some are better than others. I had a question for you scientists though. So the one worm that I want to use, but difficult to hear in this weather pattern are the blues, uh, Malaysian blues, Hawaiian blues, whatever term, uh, actually from, aren't they from cashmere? In India, if I remember correctly. Now they're a smaller worm, uh, diameter as well, uh, girth as well as length. Are there any studies showing that a red wiggler produces a better, from a, a biology standpoint, a better uh, mm -hmm. worm casting versus some of the, the European night crawlers or the Malaysian blues? I just wondered if there was anything. Not like, again, I got out of it in like 2012. So there may be studies more recently, um, but there were very few people doing those kinds of comparisons. Um, and again, uh, kind of the schism in this whole thing is like there are people focused on making it and then there are people interested in using it, but there's not a ton of right. talking to each other. So the, like what there probably are, are comparison studies of like, okay, we tried four different species of worms. These are the ones that produce compost faster. But like, is that compost better for the plants? Like that's kind of been the disconnect all along is that all the ag engineers and everyone focused on waste management has not really synced up like 100% with people focused on use and quality. Um, so that would just be my two cents there is that maybe someone has done that. Um, I'm sure they've done it from a waste production angle, but I'm not sure that anyone has looked into that from like a quality angle. And I wanted to ask you, too, how do you feel about like a pre-compost, hot composting stuff? And you too, Christy, like, um, especially like with plant-based composts, like in terms of phyto, phytosanitation, like making sure no pathogens are jumping over, like, do you prefer ones that have had like hot compost first and then fed to worms or have you not seen difference in quality on that type of thing? Well, I guess I could answer that two ways. One is that out of habit, I put material through a thermophilic uh, mm -hmm. cycle of about nine months with the mesophilic to re-up the nutrient density of the material before it goes into the worm bins. Um, and I guess I would say that I'd probably want to stick to that because I get a more mm -hmm. consistent, for lack of a better word, a more consistent bedding. And mm -hmm. I can put in my aeration amendments like say pumice or uh, rice holes or something like that. So I just, I think maybe just from that standpoint, getting the material consistent so that you get a more even uh, cycle in the vermiculture deal. Does that make sense? That makes a lot of sense. Okay. Christy, are you like a pre-hot compost and then worm compost or? Sorry, I was uh, talking. <laughs> oh, no worries. I know that's classic, like, oh, I'm muted. <laughs> um, we do, we do pre-compost for uh, two to three weeks. Um, we're pretty crazy about um, keeping it consistent, keeping the temperature monitored and logged. Uh, I don't want it to get too hot. I don't, I, I want it to stay pretty even, but do its job. And um, then I want to um, let it settle for a little bit and feed the, feed the right amount so that we don't cook them because we know that even though it's composted two to three weeks, it's not composted. So it's uh, really readily available to heat back up in the bed if you uh, if you don't control it really carefully. And then of course, if it heats back up in the bed, you get like crawl off, right? Like all the worms are like too hot, I'm leaving. They do, yeah, they do. So I keep those temperatures monitored um, and um, 
uh, a controlled environment is uh, a, a conditioned environment is is really really helpful. So we um, can can monitor that that air temperature in the in the in the in barn, if you will, and um, take take it really seriously when it starts warming up just a little bit. <laughs> What what is your band of uh, air temperature that you want to keep it within? And and then also, I assume you have uh, temperature. Uh, you're monitoring the the temperature of the composting process itself. Right. Well, the air temperature in the worm barn, um, if it if we can keep it around eighty or eighty five uh, or less, <clears throat> then then we can pretty much control. The temperature in the in the worm bed. It's all about ambient. Um, as far as the temperature in the composting systems, we want those to just reach their normal levels for pathogen reduction and, and that process. But um, I like to keep it around uh, 120 or so just to, um, to keep it evenly composting, um, but having that band of temperatures lower that will be conducive to fungal activity and so on. <clears throat> Got it. And, and then what, um, Allison, you touched a while ago on kind of like innovate, I guess, innovations in commercial production. I'm thinking like tools, technologies, processes. So between you and Christy, can you talk about, you know, things that have come along process or tool wise that uh, are now kind of part of best practices and in, in terms of producing at scale? I mean, there's like medium scale, right? And then like the super large scale. So uh, really like the key one for super large scale is the idea of a continuous flow. But like, Christy, are, are you and Jim, are you guys running continuous flow, like uh, medium sized ones or big ones? Or like what what's the scale of your operations? Well, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, it We have... <clears throat> Um, two 45 foot beds. Okay. And then in another location, we've got 96 foot beds. So they're, um, they behave the same, um, which has been interesting to see. Uh, but one is in a very, very controlled environment and the other is not. And I would definitely say large, medium, or small, if you're going to work with a a continuous flow through system. Um, <clears throat> they nailed it in vermiculture technology. Yeah. Keep it in a controlled environment. Yeah, and honestly, I would say that that's the one, right? Like <laughs> any other, like, are there any other kind of accessory innovations of like, oh, this makes it easier to handle <clears throat> material or to move things from place to place? Well, anytime you can automate you you're you're ahead of the game but then it just is depending on scale if it makes sense if you've got mm -hmm. a couple of small beds and it's uh, it, it's not cost effective but um, um, the all systems that are automated whether they're feeders or conveyors under the system to move the vermicompost after harvest uh, any of those are, are very helpful, but it really does depend on scale. And I have run a continuous flow. It was just the worm wigwam. Uh, so yeah, I've, I've run two of those, like just the three foot wide ones. Uh, and they're great. Like you just feed on the top and harvest from the bottom and it's, it's pretty cool. But that's, that's the extent of my, <laughs> I've done like a bin and then a worm wigwam and then anything bigger than that. And uh, I do not know. <laughs> I just like looking at them. I like touring those facilities, but. <laughs> well, you're welcome to come to California anytime, Allison. <laughs> cool. Well, Christy, can you talk about your process? I mean, if Jim's saying how special your castings are, I mean, you're, you're doing things <clears throat> differently than your average commercial producer. So what, what do you think makes 
a good quality casting process wise? Well, I think an enclosed environment um, I, I, we have found is just what produces a more consistent product. What you're trying to do, I think, is really um, create an environment that's as close to nature for the worms as possible. So um, uh, indoors where it's dark and moist is where they prefer to be if they, they, sh they like to be left alone. Um, so uh, feeding them a consistent product um, keeps their health uh, in place, um, offering them an environment which is uh, temperature wise uh, to their liking, um, just kind of like looking at what happens in nature and <clears throat> um, just monitoring everything. It's just a lot of obser obs observation, a lot of monitoring. Um, it's, it's caring for what you're doing. What, what type of, of food are, are the worms getting? I mean, are, are you sourcing farm waste, uh, food waste? Uh, are you giving them something? I mean, what's, cause they got to eat a lot of food. So what's, <laughs> what, what's the, what's the input? Yeah, we, we use separated dairy solids. Um, when I first started and read as much as I could read and got more confused with all of the information online, it was uh, very inconsistent. Um, it was uh, obvious to me that we really had to take it to another level and that's when I found Rhonda Sherman. So I attended the, the first conference in North Carolina way back in 2010 and um, became fast friends with Rhonda, listened to Norman intently, paid attention to Tom Herlihy and one of the first things that came out of his mouth was, it's all in the feedstock. And Our that was really out. Good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, it was really um, a, an eye opener for me because I really thought, gee, worms, don't they eat everything? Well, they do, but it really depends on your end goal. Mm -hmm. So uh, we looked into sourcing separated dairy solids, which is what we use consistently and um and uh and from there the process is just really paying attention can, can you talk about what separated dairy solids are and uh is that unique because uh, I, I i think of that i mean when i read stuff on like what you should and should not put into your worm bin uh i believe dairy and meat are kind of up there at the top well, yeah, and I'll clarify that. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, separated dairy solids is really just a dairy manure that goes through a separation process. And the separation process separates the solids from the liquids. And they can use a variety of types of separating processes, but we end up with these solids as a result of that process. And that's uh, a product that is really, really wet. Uh, probably 85%. And then through the composting processes, the, the moisture is reduced, um, the temperature is monitored, uh, the, the, the whole decomposing process starts and the reduction takes place and, um, and you get a consistent product when you feed in consistent materials. So Christy, I have a couple questions actually. Um, is, the, is the dairy solids, is that what you would consider the bedding as well as the feedstock? Like, is that the whole of what you're putting in there or is there like a, a thermophilic comp comp component as well? Um, uh, well, going through the separated solids when they go through the, the initial composting process before it's fed to the worms, that's where the thermophilic microbiology starts building up. So um, they, it's, there's no worms in that environment at all when they're first going through the thermophilic process for two to three weeks. And you guys handle that on site and then do, and then put it in the system or does it come we, to you? Yeah, no, we do. We, we monitor everything from start to finish. 
Gotcha. Have you seen any carryover? My second question is, have you seen any carryover from any sort of um, medications or treatments that the, the dairy cows are receiving that actually translates into any portions of your process? Like, do they, are they there when, they, when the solids show up and then gone when the vermicompost is finished? Or are they not a factor at all? Or um, um, you know, we, we have done some testing to the end that you're discussing. Um, no, we haven't. We test the um, material when it comes off the separator, then we test it after it's composted, and then we test, or test the final product, which is the most important. But um, we're, we're all about diversity. And one of the earlier questions that came up was, you know, what has the science community learned and what have papers uh, kind of suggested are things that happen in the world of vermicompost. And boy, I just keep coming away with, we don't know anything. <laughs> the more we learn, the more we know we don't, don't, don't know a lot. And uh, it's a fascinating mixture of microbes and soil and everything that goes in it and how plants respond to each one um, we, I haven't posted on our, on our website yet, but we had some students from Ohio State University Great. choose our product to do uh, a three-year trial. And it was a horticulture-based trial that were in, they were in greenhouses and they were trying to um, figure out how much peat moss reduction they could use in their, in their greenhouses by, by substituting peat moss with um, vermicompost and biochar. And uh, I'll post it. It was, it was really interesting. They ended up with 25% less use of peat as a result of substituting vermicompost and biochar. And the vermicompost ended up to be 25% of the mix. That's awesome. Well, and another great thing about separated dairy solids is like dairy cattle, if, you, if you're collecting manure from the milking barn, if a cow is sick and like needs to be on antibiotics for mastitis or something like they're not in the milking barn, <laughs> like they're on another part of the dairy. So in terms of like carryover of like antibiotics and any sorts of types of things like that, um, that's I think one of the reasons why separated dairy solids are so sought after. I mean, many reasons, it's a great material, like it really results in great <laughs> end product. Um, but you also, if you're collecting from the milking barn, none of those cows are on antibiotics. None of them are like can be on anything because they're being actively, actively milked. So um, yeah, that, that's another benefit of, of having uh, like specifically dairy manure and not just general cattle manure. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. I, I know that's one fine. of the biggest worries just as a, from a consumer standpoint, when you see animal-based products, that's one of the first things that comes to mind. So, so thanks for clarifying that. I have to jump off, but I'm going to come back. I got a Zoom meeting, and I'll be back in a little while. Well, j just quickly, Christy, before you go, Hetty B asked, what I don't understand is, isn't cow manure a perfect compost material straight from the animal? Why waste the energy on fractioning it? By composting it? Well, well you, you said you separate the solids, and I guess Kirk or Hetty's question was just, why not just put it straight in? And Christy, if you need to hop off, I can I can field that one. Okay, that would be great. Thanks, Allison. Okay. Because we'll, that we'll, is a good question, but it's got a really good answer. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll see I you in a bit. This one. <laughs> All right, cool. All right, bye, Christy. Soon, Christy. We'll see you in a bit. Okay. And so, go. Like, if you were going through a pasture and like picking up cow patties, yes. Um, but again, in like a, a milking barn situation. Um, the like liquid and solid waste are mixed together and then mixed with like a ton of water as the barn is kind of being washed out. Usually they have a collection system like underneath. Um, so it's a slurry, which uh, is usually then like just applied to fields in, in a manure spreader. Um, but it's, it's like a quite wet slurry. Um, and one of the things I learned from, from working with Worm Power and working with Tom Herlihy was, you know, if you can, like, if you can take that slurry, if you can put it through, I think he was using a fan separator at, at the coin farms. Um, if you can put it through a fan separator, you get these lovely solids, 
And then you get liquid that's pumpable. So you can actually use less fuel driving it around, you know, and you have like a liquid that then you can add to cornfields or put in, you know, pump to a manure lagoon and like cap the lagoon and do methane flare offs. Like it, it opens up a whole additional world of manure management options once you separate like the solids from the liquids. And again, yes, if you're following a cow in a pasture and you're picking up the patties, like it, it's probably still a little wet. Um, you'd probably have to mix it with a bulking agent to get the thermophilic compost going. Um, but that's a great question. And, and it really is due to how the, how the wastes are managed in like a, a, a milking barn scenario. And it's, it's gloppy stuff, man. Like if you, if you put it in a pile, uh, there's no amount of hay that you could, or straw that you could mix with that to get it to compost. It's, it's just a wet mess. So um, the, that, that separation is really important. That is a helpful clarification. Yeah, and then uh, the, uh, whew, I heard a story about when the fan separator backed up and you can tell because the inside of that like building around the separator was like, oh, I would hate to be in there when that backed up because it was just like floor to ceiling, like poop on the walls. Yeah. So I wanted to thank you for mentioning worm power. I followed that story as it got started several years ago, it was quite a phenomenal operation uh, at the height of their glory, how many worms they had in production. Yeah. So it was a uh, hundred million was the last time I uh, looked at any data. <clears throat> and then <clears throat> a lot of the work uh, that was presented, or I shouldn't say that, some of the work that was presented at via the YouTube venue from Cornell included a lot of participation by the gentleman from Sonoma Valley mm -hmm. uh, Worm Farms. Jack and Chambers, yeah. Now yeah, that, yeah. That would be the other, one of the other ones on the West Coast that I would uh, uh, recommend or suggest or whatever. So what, what? Jack said no, just because he's kind of like out of like the actual day-to-day -day operations, but I, I think we got their CSO. I think Margaret yeah, Mar Mar Margaret Lloyd is currently on a tomato farm, but uh, hopefully later today she'll be off the farm. And then uh, their CEO, um, who is Richard North, uh, will hopefully be able to come on on another day. So... Anyway, but uh, and, uh, Tom, Tom, we're trying, we're, we're wrangling with Tom right now. We're like, just come on and say hi. <laughs> of worm power. And uh, I'm one of those uh, small time uh, produce. I just do enough for a garden. So I use usually a hundred or 200 gallon uh, smart pots. The ones that breathe, uh, keep down the, well, you know, just you get a lot of air into the mass. So uh, I generally figure six months and I try to inoculate like say a, a yard with 30, 40 pounds of worms and whatever cocoons are coming along for the ride as well. So um, I think I got a pretty good handle on it from the home gardener perspective. I've had flow throughs and I quite frankly found them Mm, vertical and horizontal. I found them uh, a little more uh, challenging, not challenging, but you just have, it's more rigid. Whereas in a, mm -hmm. you know, a smart pot, you dump your material and mix in your blah, blah, blah. And uh, here you go, wormies, and uh, put a cardboard cover on it and call it a day. So that's kind of a path of least resistance, I guess, is where I'm at. I am also a lazy composter. Like, but that's the thing with the highly engineered systems. Christy's not kidding. You have to monitor everything all the time. And, you know, you're, you're kind of running it at the edge of its capacity. And yeah, like a couple, like a temperature shift of like five degrees can then kick off thermophilic composting in your bed and then make all the worms oh, yeah. crawl away. Like it's there, that's like a screaming machine that's run. Like you, you, you have to have continuous like data on all the things. And like, yeah, if, if you're into that, it's super fun, but like, it's also super fun to just feed the worms and walk away. And, yeah, like, exactly. I'm more later. interested in yeah. seeing how the tomatoes are doing. You're benefiting from the compost or from the vermicompost. 
And I had a, that's another question I have. And everything that I've read going back several years, it's always you only want to use 15% or something like that, uh, that your benefits uh, level off after that. Okay. But they're talking about castings is what I'm usually thinking. And we're dealing with really vermicompost. So we're not dealing with 100% castings. So that's another like super complex issue. And, of like and, and actually on that, can you, because yeah. I think someone asked a while ago, are castings and vermicompost the same thing? There were a couple of companies out there that were saying that they were selling 100% castings. Um, it's, it's hard to say, like, I never personally evaluated any of those materials. Um, but I think it would be, like, hard to get 100% castings. Like, you could. And I, I don't know that you would have seen, like, uh, comparisons, head-to-head -head comparison of both, right? Like, I haven't seen anyone say, okay, well, this is the castings plus a little bit of bedding, like, at the, at the peak of its, you know, like, uh, readiness <laughs> to be used. And then this is, like, just the pure castings. I haven't seen a convincing head-to-head -head comparison that would tell me that there's any benefit to the castings on their own. Um, but I will say, even with the vermicompost itself, yeah, anything over like 20% or maybe even uh, like Christy was saying, like some of the OSU students were able to, to substitute at 25%, you start to get um, like drainage issues in the media, right? Because potting media is all about keeping enough moisture for the roots, but then also allowing enough drainage for them to, to breathe because roots also breathe. Um, and from my experience doing exactly that, okay, we put in 10, we put in 20, we put in 30, and some of the early work at, at um, in Clive Edwards' group uh, with Norm Aaron they were able to show like, oh, there's diminishing returns. Like you put in over 50% and it's just a mucky mess and the, the plants don't like it. So um, yeah, like, and again, that depends on the material, right? And I'm, I'm a huge proponent of like, try it yourself, right? And every material is so different that like you get a new batch in from someone that you're thinking of buying it from, do that in your own greenhouse, do like 10, 20, 30, 40% and, and really dial it in for your production system. Um, because it, yeah, it, it really does matter because you, you get nutrients and you get great stuff, but you also <laughs> run the risk of suffocating your roots if, if you put too much of it in. So it's not, it's not always like more is better scenario uh, for sure. Uh, that's a great point. Well, so Hetty B in the chat said you can go over 25% as long as you develop and maintain robust fungal structure. Cool. And then, uh, hold on a second. Sorry, I'm, I'm monitoring the chat as well. Yeah. Um, so, so, sorry, so someone was asked, talking about um hold on now i lost it um someone asked if tom was still at worm power and i said no right no nope. right but if we can get him to talk about it uh he has since built i believe two separate facilities vermicomposting facilities since then he's also um helped build a bunch of biosolids composting facilities so he has uh He's still in the game. Uh, he sent me a video from one facility that he built and it like, it blew my mind. It was so much bigger than Worm Power. Like, oh, I wanna visit it, it's so cool. So we'll see if I can get him to talk about, about any of that stuff. So fingers crossed. Uh, so Treddy Ho uh, said another question for Allison. How long did she see effects of vermicompost of soil microbiome in the field after transplant PLFA study? Yeah, so we um, we weren't using PLFA. We were using uh, TRFLP transcription. Oh, man, terminal fragment length. Terminal, oh, man. See, this is what happens when uh, that's uh -huh. 2005. <laughs> TRFLP, terminal restriction fragment length polymorphism. So that was one of the early community profiling techniques um, just based off of uh, like 16S uh, in terms of like taking one fragment of, of uh, DNA sequence from the entire community, restriction enzyme digesting it, and then looking at those patterns and extrapolating from that like complexity of the community and community profile. 
Um, so yeah, we found, we, we saw very precise differences like in the potting mix itself. Like if you took roots out of there, you're like, whoa, those are really different communities. Um, but we continued to see, I think until August out in the field and I'll, I'll share the paper um, uh, in kind of the resources here. Uh, I believe we saw measurable community difference in, until uh, August in the field. And what we didn't know with the, with the technique that we were using, what we weren't able to answer is, are those the same microbes that were from the vermicompost that stayed on the roots that entire time? Or is it more of a succession effect where, okay, well, you started with this one microbial community and maybe that community just developed differently over time than the other ones? And that wasn't something that we could answer uh, with the technique that we were using, but it's certainly something that I'd be curious to know, like, in, in future studies and, you know, to follow what other people are doing in that space, because we were kind of blown away because we were like, oh, yeah, I don't know, like, yeah, maybe you could influence the, the transplant once it's in the field, but like, and, and you kind of could. <laughs> um, and, and we did see some benefits. Again, no significant difference in overall yield, um, but some like P equals 0.08, uh, which apparently is like good enough for horticulture, <laughs> uh, some, some differences in uh, early yield. Got it. Okay. Hold on. I, I have like 80 things open that I'm going to, I did, did Tom, did Tom text you at all that? Yeah, uh, I, I sent him the link. Okay. They're linked. <laughs> so, so with, with your work, uh, you worked with both thermophilic compost and vermicompost. So, uh, are, are there any consider, are there differences between the two in terms of disease suppression? Uh, so I, ooh, I don't think I did that for the disease suppression study, but for our tomato study, that's why it was so fun working with Tom is I believe we took thermophilic compost from him and then vermicomp, like, so he took his initial hot composting step. He took some of that and windrowed it like for nine months to do like the whole rest of that process. Um, and then, of course, like after that initial step, then he took it and put it through the vermicomposters because we were very interested about those kind of process questions. But of course, you can only make that comparison if it's the same starting material and then handled that way. So um, we did see differences in uh, seedling performance and then in also the, the rhizosphere community. Um, and that's the same starting material, just one was thermophilic compost and, and one was pharmacomposted. I'm going to pull up that paper. Excuse me while I, uh, let's see. Um, okay, so it's been a while. I should have looked at this before I reference this. Yeah, everybody bear with us. We're, we're winging this. <laughs> yeah, you know, but yeah. Uh, let's see. There we go. I'm just pulling up just to make sure I'm not misrepresenting the results. <laughs> pulling up what we found for the for the seedlings. Um, oh, I forgot about this chapter. I wrote a chapter on just the suppression of plant pathogens by vermicompost. I can share that one too. Yeah. Okay, so applied soil ecology. That's right. It wasn't meant to be. Um, what did we see? Allison, while you're looking, do you, um, do you have an ideal ratio of bedding to food stock that you, you like to work with? Oh, again, I am more on the use end. So like table that question for Tom and then we're going to pounce on him when he gets on here. Poor Tom. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and then, um, the role like starting material in terms of disease suppression is is there a difference in terms of what you start with and what you get um that's really hard to do because like you can do a meta-analysis of everything everyone's like published but unless you're doing a head-to-head -head comparison of like okay we took you know, six different starting materials, put them through the same composting process, and then tested them all in the same plant bioassay. 
you, you can't really say like and and tell people do that kind of stuff so right um yeah so one of the things that back to that question of like okay well what if you take the same material and then thermophilic and vermicompost it um something that we found in both both years of of, of batches um and again we didn't do like this is just a single test of the material itself, just for like micronutrients, macronutrients, you know, pH electrical conductivity. But what really struck us is that the total nitrogen was somewhat similar between the thermophilic compost and the vermicompost, but the plant available nitrogen, the nitrate nitrogen um, was 10x in 2004 and like six or seven X uh, in 2005. So, and that's pretty well established. If you look at some of like the earthworm gut papers and people looking at the microbiology of the earthworm gut, there are a lot of microbes that can convert organic nitrogen into plant available nitrogen uh, into the nitrate. So I, I think, um, and that's something that I think makes the vermicompost, liquid compost extracts like that much better is that, you know, if you add water, to a compost that doesn't have like soluble nitrogen in it, like you're you're not going to be able to extract that into the final product. Um, but if if there's a lot of nitrate and kicking around, like that just goes immediately like into solution. So, um, and if anyone, if I'm if I'm saying that wrong, if there are any chemists in the crowd that are like, oh no no, that's not right, just tell me because I am not a chemist. But <laughs> <laughs> if I got that one right. <laughs> Um, yeah, so that was one thing that really struck us was like, okay, well, the finished material was pretty similar on most of those metrics, but like the nitrate N was, was like seven to 10 X. Um, and then, uh, also potassium was higher and you're like, how's that even possible? Like it started from the same material, like how, <laughs> you know, like how so yeah, and again, that wasn't like super extensive. That was just, okay, we're doing a baseline test to know what we've got going into the study. Um, uh, germination was equivalent, and but then uh, dry biomass at planting was higher for the vermicompost uh, both years. And again, that's the same starting material uh, put through the two processes and then tested with the same plants in and I wish people were doing more of that kind of work um, because that helps us learn, you know, that, that, that helps move the ball forward of like, oh, okay, like that tells us something about the process and that helps us generate hypotheses that we can test about what about that process could be changing that material in that way. Um, yeah, and then for early yield... Yeah, they were pretty equivalent. Oh no, uh, in 2005, the early yield was better for vermicompost versus thermophilic compost. And again, that's just using 20% of it in the mix when you planted the seed and that's treating them the same all the way through to harvest. And that's what blew my mind. I'm like, that's the same material, just composted two different ways. <laughs> Yeah, and the marketable yield was slightly higher, but not statistically significantly higher for vermicompost versus thermophilic compost. Yeah. Well, so, so, so a little while ago, uh, where now I just lost it. Treddy Ho said, "Ask Allison to show the zoo spores video." Oh, the zoospores video. Can uh, the zoospores show a video in the thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, do do you have it? Like you, yeah, I can, it's you on can my YouTube channel. Yeah. Um, oh, I've got like two computers. I'm using the mouse for the wrong computer. I'm fine. Everything's fine. I just did a three thousand mile road trip for work. So if I am uh, battier than usual, I'm I'm blaming that. <laughs> yeah, you you were in the cornfields of Iowa uh, a couple days. ago. I was in the cornfields of Colorado, Minnesota. Iowa and Illinois. <laughs> That's what, yeah. So, so P, P, and while you're pulling this up, people are talking about rabbit poop in the chat. Uh, oh yeah, um, there's some great Australian systems 
that of like rabbits and then worms and then like the you know vermicompost or rabbit manure i i had a rabbit and worms and man that was good stuff like i mean i didn't have like a the rabbit lived upstairs and the worms lived in the basement so i had to like carry the stuff down there but uh I, my garden loved it that that was really good stuff so does like the full vermicompost one or just the zoospore one let me see if i remember and then you see there should be something where you can share your screen. Yeah. Let me see. I've got, I think I have a, let's see. Um, Folks are also curious what I, your YouTube channel is. Oh, I just, uh, I started a YouTube channel back when I was a baby. <laughs> Um, uh, I did a lot of, I hosted a lot of speakers at Cornell through a grad student organization. So I have a lot of those, like, um, just different speakers around topics on sustainable agriculture. And then like, uh, some of my grower talks, uh, and then like some, some kind of microscopy videos that I put together. Um, uh, but I have not added anything to this in like a long time. Can you ask ex like which one? Is it like the seven minute vermicompost one or just like the short one? I think it's probably the vermicompost and pythium suppression one. I have no idea. All right, well, uh, we'll, we'll do this one. Why don't, why don't you pick one and we'll- I'll pick yeah. one, I'll pick one. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, share screen. screen. Yeah, so this is, um, we did some some outreach stuff for the project with Warm Power. Um, and uh, yeah, these were some of uh, my microscopy videos. And then in this video, uh, some of Eric Carr's uh, really great time lapses of uh, zoosporangium development. Like he did some great microscopy work in, in the Nelson lab, so. And I think this one, oh no, it's done. So do you want to narrate what we're seeing? That's Tom. <laughs> I think that's Mark Elzinga's greenhouse in uh, Kalamazoo. So can you hear her or like, should I narrate? You, you should narrate. I'll narrate. Okay. So yeah, um, vermicompost is awesome. Uh, <laughs> so this is a uh, sporangium of Pythium afanidermatum. Uh, and then this is a time lapse of their development. And we, and that is, so the cartoon is like, it makes a vesicle um, or a vesicle. And then the vesicle splits and turns into these crazy zoospores. And then uh, my favorite thing ever to watch under the microscope is the birth of the zoospores. The vesicle breaks and then they all swim away. And uh, that entire process happens over about half an hour. And then they use chemotaxis um, to find a germinating seed. So they don't swim, so that, that blue is like the exudates, like a gradient of exudates being released by a germinating seed. And they kind of just swim around in the soil until they get a hint of some chemical compound. And then they end up changing their direction more frequently, which results in an overall directional movement. They drop their flagella, they insist, uh, and then they germinate and they they eat the heck out of that seed. Um, so here is a time lapse I did of them. Like that was a root border cell on um, cucumbers. And then here's our schematic of like, okay, we dipped it in the vermicompost for it. We germinated it for eight hours in vermicompost, moved it to sand. And then whatever those microbes were that were on the surface of the seed, um, the zoospores like just, they, there was no infection, right? So how did they not get there? And at the time we made the video, yeah, so there's some of the disease suppression assays. Um, again, you lose all ability to, to suppress the disease if you, if you uh, uh, sterilize it. So it is a living thing. This is all um, at Worm Power. Oh, that's me when I was a baby. It was great, guys, making me feel real old. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and then just some of our schematics of like, you know, all of this stuff, all of these interactions going on in the spermosphere and how can we use our understanding of it to, um, uh, to develop like better, uh, 
better procedures for managing plant disease. So yeah, and again, Rick Carr did a lot of those uh, great time lapses too. Very cool. Yeah. All right. Let's see. How do I get back to that? Ah, where? <laughs> how do you okay. unshare? The, there we go. Okay. All right. I'm back. <laughs> Um, so Jim, uh, while we're, d did Tom text you back? Cause I know, uh, uh I, like I'm like messaging him on all platforms. I'm like, what's up? <laughs> like texting. Him. All right. Where is he at? Oh, he's calling me right now. I will be right back. Okay. All right. Well, Jim, while Allison is trying to pull Tom in, do you have any, uh, deep thoughts on what you've heard so far? Well, yes. I mean, um, the folks that you've assembled today are at the very top of their game in this discussion. You don't get any better than this. This isn't uh, bro science at all. You're real, you know, it's a real deal. And um, I bought the book that uh, Allison uh, referenced when it first came out, uh, Vermiculture Technologies. And what it is is an anthology <clears throat> assembled by uh, Dr. Clive Edwards, Rhonda Sherman, and, and uh, uh, Dr. Aramcon as well. And these are uh, papers from different researchers and uh, organizations from around the world in the area of vermicomposting. What's fascinating about it is to see because of differences in culture and weather pattern and a number of uh, things, the different approaches. And it is an expensive book. And now it's, it's dropped. When it first came out, it was over $400. And I think it's down to about 125 now. Uh, the title is Vermiculture Technologies with the lead author being Clive Edwards. There you go. And if that's an area that a person wants to move into uh, for their plant production, that's the, the Bible. Uh, it doesn't get any better than that. And so it's not an easy book to get through. In term, it's not like uh, you know, worm castings for dummies or you know something like that. This is really hardcore, legitimate science that you can really put your arms around and uh, duplicate in your own uh, in your own uh, operation. I would like hope that Allison can address uh, the or any or some of your other guests. Uh, the practicality of setting up flow through uh, bins, vertical or horizontal, because that's really where your production is at. And Cascadian, I want to address a question that you asked. Here's what I know about worm power, that at the time, this goes back about 10 years when I first got interested and did some study on it. They were taking the cow manure and doing a thermophilic compost, fair enough. And then they would add by volume 10% silage. So that, that's done by with uh, lactobacillus. You buy that at a farm store. That's why we call it a silage to put the uh, green materials away. And so they would add the silage with the lac lactobacillus cultures together at about 10%. But that could have changed. That was in the very, very beginnings when they were working in Quonset huts. And as you can see by some of the video work that Allison has provided, they got really big. When I kind of dropped out of studying them, they were up to, I think, 150 million worms was the estimate that they had uh, in production. So it was quite, we even got them here on the West Coast. There were a couple of nurseries that carried worm power products. That shows you how difficult it is finding quality worm castings or vermicompost, whatever you want to call it. You either got to do your own or you know, cross your fingers, hope for the best. That's Tom. He's hopping on. And he was amazed. I remember in the early days at Worm Power, 
because that's who we collaborated with for my dissertation work. Um, he's like, people are paying just as much for shipping as they are for the material, but they were like, this is the best material we've found. So we're willing to do that. Um, yes. Yeah, quality is everything. So, I mean, yeah. All right, go, go, go ahead. Um, the first time that I used castings, but I was coming in from gross store products, I don't know, Ocean Forester or something like that. And so the first time I went over and bought some castings and mixed up a soil, about three weeks into it, I just remember sitting on a chair staring at my plants thinking, so this is how it's supposed to work. I get it now. You know, uh, the growth rate, the health, the bigger, and then other things that you would check for in cannabis that you might not in corn, you know, corn cobs or something. And so I've been, a, I don't know what the word is, but uh, I've never seen a, uh, a thermophilic compost that came close, including my own. Uh, and with the worm castings, what I like about it is you have control. You can control if you want to add grains to increase the length and girth. Uh, you can control other materials to add density, nutrient density to the castings, like uh, say kelp meal or neem meal, that kind of thing, carrageer meals. Just a great, uh, great industry. And they've done some wonderful things over the last 12, uh, 10, 12 years has really been remarkable. At least there's a discussion about it out there in the, in the cannabis world about using castings. And there is the man, Tom oh. Hurley. <laughs> Tom, we've been talking about you. This is so exciting. <laughs> Thanks for joining okay. <laughs> Well, uh, that, it's a slow day if this is exciting. <laughs> So how is everybody today? We're doing good. great. We're good. We got about 200 and I don't know, 50, 60 people watching us on wow. YouTube. They're passionate enthusiasts. You guys are like the rock stars up on the stage. <laughs> They're throwing their, their undies up at you. Well, <laughs> how about food scraps? We can feed them to the worms <laughs> later. So why don't Allison and Jim, why don't you guys um, kind of, Get, give a Tom intro by by talking about. I mean, we, we've touched on them, but uh, cue them up. So Tom, I I told him that I met you. I think it was U.S. Composting Council 2003 in San Antonio, and you were still a consulting um, ag engineer at the time. So you were like permitting and and helping build like different facilities around the country and you had the crazy idea and you can uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you were like, you know what? Like this has like commercial viability at large scale and like, I'm just gonna show that you can do it. And uh, so I, I knew Tom throughout his whole process of um, like the facility, you know, like who would be the forward thinking dairy, <laughs> dairy farmer who would be like, yes, I'll give you my manure, right? Um, and uh, through the early construction phase. And then Jim was mentioning, you know, some of the YouTube videos and uh, some of the work that we did with like Cornell Waste Management Institute and the USDA SBIR program. Um, and like I said, I just showed like our, our main schematic of kind of the zone four stuff uh, from one of the like early outreach videos. I know, look, look at that. He's got <laughs> one of the posters behind him. That's like, how much of a geek I am. <laughs> hey, that's that's our schematic from one of our research posters. So. <laughs> awesome. That's oh, that's the one we won the outreach prize for. That was like that bought me the new microscopy camera. So that that's the poster, man. <laughs> Otherwise, I would have had to take like ten thousand zoospore images on a Pentax and like get the get the film developed because the microscope was older than I was. <laughs> but the the camera worked. So yeah. So. so uh, uh, Right. Um, you want to talk a little bit about your background? Because I've been saying like you're like you're an engineer, but sure. you're also one of the few people in the industry that's like really connected the dots between the process of making it and then making a quality product that is like like really great for high end horticulture. So. 
Right. So I, I guess then my, so my background was, so for about 15, 16 years, I was a consulting engineer. I used to design waste management projects. Uh, basically, if it stinks and it's organic, I used to deal with it, everything from landfills to composting facilities to recycling facilities. And I did, I kind of got uh, bit by the bug. I did a project in Australia and I came across a vermicomposting toilet in Australia. And I kind of thought, well, you know, there, you know, we'd always heard about it in the composting world, you'd heard about vermicomposting. And so then we just, uh, you know, I kind of always thought it needed the engineer's loving touch and then to be done at scale um, really required engineering now, uh, you know, it's one, it's perfectly viable to do it in the backyard in a bin and underneath your kitchen sink and things. But uh, you know, I tend to deal in things when we start talking about tens or hundreds of thousands of tons a year. That's you know, that's when you call the engineers usually. And so yeah, you know, uh, my whole goal was always to kind of now take what you know these organic wastes that have sometimes problematic physical properties and to then turning it into vermicompost. Uh, with realizing that vermicompost is not an end product, it's a component in a grower's growing system. So he needs something that's going to show up consistent, uniform, and repeatable. Mm -hmm. uh, he doesn't want to, you know, you think about how hard, you know, how many variables Mother Nature throws at you when you're growing a crop. The last thing in the world that they need to do is have variables in their inputs that they're going to bring into their production system. So my whole goal was, you know, let's try to find out what it is that the worms are doing uh, to, to make vermicompost great, but then treating worms like production animals. I'm, 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 I'm sorry, I'm an engineer, but I am an engineer. And so, you know, I always think, you know, cows convert corn silage into milk and I'm just using worms to convert manure into vermicompost. And so, you know, a good dairy produces animal, you know, practices animal husbandry to help out. And our whole goal is, you know, and they, they build the whole dairy farm to keep their cows happy and productive. You know, the happy cows make good cheese. Well, the same thing, happy worms make good vermicompost. So we did everything we could to kind of make a process that at scale can be run uh, like, like a facility with earthworms at the center of it. And uh, then to also then prove out to production horticulture by working with people like Allison and at, at various other land grant universities that it's not hokum, you know, that there really is vermicompost is a very different material than compost. And uh, that, that it, it, you know, the, the, the process is real. And uh, again, so I guess, you know, that I, I've got some pictures of facilities or some background. I don't really I, I'm new to kind of Zoom meetings, so uh, you show know, us the new facilities, Tom. <laughs> yeah, so we had, uh, people were like, "Oh, is he still at Worm Fire?" I'm like, "No, but wait till you see what he's been building since then." So I don't know if you're able to share those, but we'd certainly love to. Uh, you're gonna have to. I'm not sure I know how to share. We use MS Teams at work these days. Oh yeah, we use MS Teams too. Screen. Yeah, right there, okay. green one on the bottom. Okay. Uh, yeah, so Christy Christy echoed that too, that it's like an indoor environment, like a controlled environment, and, and really focusing on like what keeps the worms happy. So, um, okay. Well, and I'm going to run through it then because it's usually a, it's a little longer than I have time for today, unfortunately. Okay. So we uh, don't see your screen yet. Okay. Now I hit share, right? There you yep. go. Here it comes. Sweet. So let me go to, I'm going to go to a different one here. And then I just need to go to. Worm Wrangler. <laughs> it seems to be Worm Wrangler. Ah, okay. Yeah, Worm Wrangler. That's right. So that's my little, that's my side, that's my side gig these days. So uh, is that working now? You're all looking at my screen. Is that right? Well, um, it shows, it's like the weird presentation mode. It's very sweet. It has your notes. It says, thank host. Tell stupid worm joke. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I, th I think you need on. to hit like play presentation. Yeah, are you using an extended monitor? Because I find that if I'm trying to share a screen and I have an extended monitor, this is usually what shows up on Zoom and then like I get the presentation on my extended monitor. So yeah. there you go. Well, hopefully I have three monitors. I've got one of those. Yeah, I think it's because you're on an extended monitor. Well, and I know you're like, yeah, there you go. Is that better? Yep. Perfect. Yes. Okay. Great. 
Uh, well, so these are kind of two of the facilities I'm most familiar with. Uh, in the world. I've been heavily involved in the design and construction and operations of them. Uh, so at the one at the top, I believe is the world's largest vermicomposting facility in Torreon, Mexico. Uh, that's, if you walked up and down every worm bed, you'd walk 1.9 miles. So these are all indoor facilities. And then the one at the bottom is worm power uh, here in a uh, uh, Western New York. So I think I got the. Uh, so we've been, I've been heavily involved in large scale vermicomposting of dairy manure since 2003. These two facilities, I said, one's in the lakes of Western New York and the other is in Torreon, Mexico. And our goal is always to produce uh, commercial, commercially viable products that are consistent and uniform in their mm -hmm. characteristics. That's chemical, microbial, and physical props. Uh, the properties. Uh, and the whole idea is to standardize everything. And so when you have a standardize your input materials, you standardize your production practices, you can standardize your animal husbandry practices. Therefore, it should result in a standardized end product that then the grower, when the end of the day, we want the growers to be using vermicompost to grow their plants. They, you know, they've got to deal with all their other stuff. They, you know, you're just an input into their production system. So as we used to like to say that we are, uh, my, my whole goal is always to take vermicomposting from just a feel good endeavor to a real good endeavor. And, um, you know, one of that ways is, uh, you know, it, it needs to be environmentally sustainable, but it also has to be economically sustainable, which if it isn't, uh, it's very hard to keep it going. So uh, towards that end, uh, you know, we've done about, I think I'm up to about 20 now, what I would call peer reviewed research projects. Uh, where we secured funding from federal or state forces, about $3.5 million in R&D has been put into the process of vermicomposting and then the use of vermicompost in plant production, and then also in the use of vermicompost in plant pathology for disease suppression. Uh, between the parties that I've raised money from and been with, uh, these are about $11 million in just physical infrastructure that you're going to look at in these in various, uh, where, where they're at. And, um, Again, my key is always uh, professional engineering and being science-based in terms of uh, product claims and in production methodology. Uh, you know, one of the things I always like to start off early saying is that vermicompost is not compost. Uh, I wish they didn't share that word compost in their same name because they're very different. You know, composting is done at high temperatures. It's thermophilic microbes. There's huge variations, you know, I, and I'm a composter. I make my living composting most of the time. Uh, you know, I, I work for one of the nation, I work for the nation's largest composting company right now, well, one or two, uh, whatever. Um, but then the variations in compost are very significant. What's on the outside of the pile is very different. What's in the middle of the pile. Uh, it, it, it's a great product, but it's not, um, it's, you know, it, it, it is what it is. It's, 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 a roll, it's, a, it's a bulk commodity. While vermicompost, you know, we're using the mesophilic microbes. These are the microbes that will then live in the soil. You know, composting microbes like to live at 140 degrees. Vermicomposting microbes live at 75 degrees. So which, which microbes do you think are going to be more likely to persist in nature? Uh, and we know that there are, you know, we, we alter the, uh, the bioavailability of the nutrients, as I like to say. I can't make more nitrogen exist in vermicompost than was in the initial products, you know, conservation of matter. I can't create things. But what vermicomposting can really do is make plant available nutrients. So, you know, the, the worms do a digestion process and they can take the organic nitrogen, which is not readily plant available, and convert it and turn it into the nitrates and ammonia. They also Put in these auxin-like biochemicals, and it's an excellent process for making a uniform product. Uh, as I, you know, one, you know, a hard example of showing the difference is, you know, I can't change the total nitrogen levels, but what you can really see here is the nitrate levels, the difference between, so this is our same manure, the manure, the compost, the vermicompost. Or as we like to say, you know, all a worm is is a great big long gut. Allison, you should recognize this slide. <laughs> it's 
you know, some my, uh, not so pretty schematics from back in the day, but it gets the point across like, yeah, <laughs> it does. So, you know, the, the a worm has a crop and a gizzard in its front, just like a chicken, you know, fragment up the particle and then different parts of the intestine will, you know, have different microbial communities, have different processes. So you know, it's, it's really what we do. So uh, vermicompost, uh, people like to talk about it like it's an elemental product like iron. And so one of the things I really harp on is that vermicompost is not a product as much as it is a process. Mm -hmm. And I like to use the sausage analogy. You know, uh, a lot of things look like a sausage. You grind meat and you stuff it in a tube, but a cheddar bratwurst and a breakfast link are very different and no cook will ever use them interchangeably. So uh, vermicomposting is more this product than it is a process. And so, yeah, that's what I look like on most days now working in the compost facility. So uh, I did ask uh, at uh, Cornell University, Dr. Uh, Neil Matson and now Dr. Stephanie Beeks uh, to blindly, we sent them four vermicompost from facilities that I knew sold a lot of vermicompost and asked them to do a test. And basically, uh, these are the trials here. So at the far left, can you see my pointer or not? Yeah, we can see the pointer. Okay. So that's the control. That's just a potting mix with no fertility added. So then that's at 2.5% of, let's just call it very manure vermicompost. And this other one, so 2.5%, 5%, 10%, and 20%. Um, so those two plants have both received 20% vermicompost. You would not say that they had a comparable plant growth response. Uh, with product number B comparison and product number C, which was the closest. And if you have good eyes, you can tell that these plants are all chlorotic. They're a little nitrogen starved. Well, at 20% vermicompost, that's probably in a good budget there. Uh, so doing true statistics on this, this is a NOVA 95% confidence. So, you know, it, it is, your eyes are not lying to you. It is statistically significant difference. And I mean, vastly difference between the vermicompost. So just be a little careful when buying vermicompost. This isn't an advertisement for a specific vermicompost. It's just be a little leery if somebody says vermicompost that you then think you're going to get the best because just because you have a pile of compost and you put a worm in it doesn't really mean it's worm work material. You know, what was the initial feedstock? How well did they take care of their, their worms? Lots of things impact the quality. Uh, I get kicked, I'm an engineer, I get kicked out of the union if I don't show you a, a process flow diagram. Uh, this is how I do it with the dairy manure or human manure. So, you know, you get the mammals give manure, we squeeze it, the water goes somewhere, we take the solids. Uh, we mix them up with uh, usually a manure and some sort of uh, carbon material. Uh, go through a traditional composting process for a little while, feed it to the worms, screen it, and sell it. So uh, this is the facility in Torreon, Mexico. So this is a 10,000 head dairy, which if you're not a dairyman, this, this is a global dairy. This yeah, is, that's it's, really big, it's, it's really, It's really, really big. And so then this is the one here in New York. So this is a thousand head dairy, which is in New York, it's probably top 200 in the country in size. It would be a top 100 in New York state. Oh, and so wait, let me go back up. And so this is the vermicomposting facility. And I don't know if on, yep. And this is the vermicomposting facility here. Okay. Um, I like manure. Uh, I particularly I like dairy manure as a feedstock. You know, these animals, they have people at work on the farm have degrees in animal nutrition. So these cows are fed a very controlled diet. Therefore, the manure should come out the same every time. If I get similar manure, then I can do all my other stuff the same. Um, and so I I've vermicomposted anything, and you know, the the, the classic Mary Appleoff worms eat our garbage. That's right. You, you don't need to have a consistent feedstock to make vermicompost, but you'll have a harder time. You know, it's like the car can go 100 miles an hour or 50 miles an hour or 25 miles an hour. Uh, if I've raised, if I'm spending millions of dollars to build a vermicomposting facility and this is my business, I want it running at top speed. So 
if I start changing things, the worms will adjust to it, but it slows them down. <laughs> so, you know, I'm not telling you this is the only way to do things. This is the way I know how to do it to get it to run at top speed. Um, so just in general, if you don't know, a cow is uh, fed a very consistent diet. Uh, she eats and drinks about 300 pounds a day of food and water. Good dairy will get about 80 pounds of milk a day, but then, you know, what goes out has to, <laughs> what goes in has to come out. Every cow will generate about 110 pounds a day of manure and urine. So 1,000 head dairy, 100 pounds, that's 100,000 pounds a day from that one manure dairy or a million pounds a day from the larger dairy. Um, manure as it falls out in the back end of the cow is like a slurry. So we squeeze it. You can either squeeze it with like a, just a gravity thickener where you let it flow across. The water goes one side, the solids go the other, or we can squeeze it in a press. Uh, the farmers keep the liquids. So this is a million gallon lagoon. That's a seven million gallon lagoon. Uh, the farmer, now that we've taken the solids out, it's very pumpable. He now injects it into the ground. So this hose is connected to the lagoon and they will inject it underneath the ground. It's a very good environmental. It's much better than what's traditionally done with manure. Uh, we're not it reduces the volatilization. Yeah, that's a great. We're not going to talk about I mean, soil compaction and you don't have manure wagons running up and down the road, but this isn't a manure management talk. So, uh, but this is what it looks like. So this is what dairy manure looks like after you've squeezed it out. Uh, we, uh, we make feed recipes. Usually we load them into something like a mix wagon. We're looking at a scale. We make a recipe that's the same carbon to nitrogen ratio, bulk densities, moisture content. And then we basically go in and we do a, a, a quick thermophilic composting step. We put them in composting bays, composting tumblers. Uh, that gives pathogen destruction. So in case there were any disease pathogens in the manure, this is a, like a pasteurization step. And it also kills off uh, any weed seeds. And regulatory-wise, this lets us become certified organic. And then in New York, we had uh, 21 large of these digesters, about 45 million earthworms. And in Mexico, we, it's about twice the size there. We've got 42 of these things. They're almost an eighth of a mile long each. Uh, they're eight feet wide, I'm sorry, 244 feet long each. Uh, process control, you know, again, so we have feeders that are putting on beautiful half inch layers of feed every day. We've got, uh, you know, automated irrigation systems because moisture management is the most critical thing in earthworm husbandry. Uh, you know, it's animal husbandry. You take care of your cows, you get good milk, you take good care of your worms, you get good vermicompost and you get more worms. So these are cocoons. So if worms are happy and they're meeting other worms and making new worms, you get little things that look like little tiny grapes. Those that that's reproduction. Uh, then we screen our material up. You know, usually different growers will have different needs. Some like, um, depending on what they're putting in their pots, is it going into the soil? Is it going in potting media? Uh, you know, lots of ways we can make it. So can is the video coming through? Yeah, you can okay. even hear the birds tweeting. So this is just a sense of the scale of the facility in Florion, Mexico. That's uh, a lot of earthworm. <laughs> oh, we're not gonna show the whole video. Do you wanna see the whole video? No. Of course we wanna see the whole video. I love this video. Uh, okay. This is the one I was telling you guys about. He like WhatsApp this to me and I was like, what? Cause I asked him what he'd been up to and he just like uh, didn't uh, say yeah, what this, this sent me this video. Flying. This is still during a little bit of construction down in Torreon. So this will be the receiving areas, what you're looking at right here. Uh, being around and around. That's the dairy off to the upper left. Uh, there I am coming out of the manure pile at the bottom. And then you can see the, these are the composting drums and there's the mixer right here in the bottom left. Uh, that's the owner of the dairy right there and myself. That's Jose Luis Padilla. These are rotating composting drums. 
Material spends about nine, 10 days in there, meets time and temperature requirements for pasteurization, comes out of here. And then these are the main worm buildings right here. Each of these buildings are, oh, I forget what they even are right now. They're big, 400 feet long, 240 feet wide four of them back to back. So here's the feeder, putting down the layer of feed. So composted dairy manure. Uh, here's the automated irrigation system. Moisture management is very critical. Uh, the sides of the bin are made with recycled plastic panels. So when all those plastic bottles are chopped up. So again, starting off a little uneven here, the worm population is coming up to speed, but the uh, here you can see that, you know, in the whole goal is when you're taking care of your worms, it's really humidity management, not moisture management. You don't want to be adding water because you, you don't want, you always want that solids, liquids, and gas phases all at the same time. So this is really a great way to put down a fine mist. This thing runs 12 trips a day all by itself, all robotically. It's, uh, and there I am with a shit-eating grin. I was just gonna say you look so happy in that video. <laughs> no, it was a it's a long time coming to get to these points. Yeah. So well, okay. Cool. And so the heat building. So here you can kind of actually see the bins before they're filled up. It's a mesh in the bottom, uh, hydraulics, uh, highly automated. So you know we're doing twenty million pounds a year, and we had four and a half full time people in production. And no joke, we were selling at 12x on a value per pound basis. And I was sold out. By, by February or March of every year, we were, we were sales committed for every pound we were going to make during the year. And a good vermicompost needs to sell for at least 10 times what compost sells for on a per pound basis. Just some nice pretty shots showing the automated equipment, the beds. Um, so usually it's sold in bulk. These are two cubic yards uh, or cubic meters. They're almost analogous uh, uh, for, and then retail, we did, we tried to sell stuff in 40 pounds and five pound bags. It's, it's, a, it's, a, different, it's a different market. And then really where I think the future of vermicompost are is in the liquids, is in the extracts. And so we ship that usually in these the standard IBC totes, uh, 275 gallons, a thousand liters. So remember, extract is not tea. Uh, I am not a fan of teas. Uh, the engineer in me tells you you're making it more complicated for what can arguably be called minimal return on that complicated and certainly of the investment. And the other thing with teas, they just have no shelf life. I, there's, there's no business model I know of where you can make money on teas. People can make money selling tea brewers. People can use teas if they use them themselves on their own property very hard to imagine a, a facility that makes teas and then is able to sell them. It's just the logistics get overwhelming. So again, remember, so we kind of like to say extracts and teas are different. Extracts are, they're not aerated. I don't, I don't want to make a microbial bloom, population bloom. It's all about stability. It's more of an extensive soak. I don't want to add sugars. I don't want it. So it really comes down to the quality. Good extract depends upon a really quality vermicompost because that's really all it is. And it's a way to most growers, so solid vermicompost can only be used by a plant if you get it down in the root zone effectively. So therefore, when you're making a potting soil, you can use the granular vermicompost. But then how do you get vermicompost during the growing season? It's very hard to get the full charge in initially. So what we like to have is use the vermicompost when you make the potting soil, but then during the growing year, you do applications of the extract. And Tom, I still remember the first uh, batches that you sent and like use two liter Coke bottles for testing. Oh yeah. Hey, yes. yeah, that was yes. a super fun project. Jobs, you know, and so yeah, I, I, I went through a year. So what's the ratio? So again, what's the solubility of vermicompost? At what temperature is the solubility of vermicompost? What's the, where do you get the best return for using it? Because it's expensive and hard to make. 
So remember to marketing, it's, uh, okay, we're gonna fly through here on these stuff. We don't wanna talk about it. But uh, people love the vermicompost story. It's always been a, you know, a blessing is that uh, we get, I get written up and I didn't even know we were being written up at times. So R&D, oh, there you are, Allison. And that's Eric Nelson and Rick Carr and Susie Barbianis who runs like the tech transfer office. And uh, we got funding through the NCAT program in New York State that uh, the, some great supporting matching funding through them. There's a lot of vermicomposting expertise there. So I'm not going to give your slides though, Allison. Okay. <laughs> You will notice yeah, your name is on the bottom of all. Oh, of that, those yeah. all look interesting, though. Well, Allison, I could show them, but you would have to talk. I'm, I am yeah, not. Yeah, yeah, Allison. yeah. Let, let, let's yeah. walk through Allison. Pack okay. it up. Okay. We don't want to make him late to his next meeting, but you let us know, Tom. Okay. Cool. So I think this is some of the early transplant experiments. So um, this is kind of my weird glass funnel setup. We were trying to control matrix potential of, of the mix. Um, and my husband built me this crazy apparatus out of wood and I ended up using it for like six years in a growth chamber. Um, yeah. And so, right, this uh, pythium is just a very seedling damping off disease. It's a, a large problem in, in cannabis production too. Yeah. So you don't get your moisture right uh, when you're starting off. You can Damping off is what it's used. Pythium is what a scientist call it. Damping off is what growers call it. Yeah, seed and seedling rots and damping off. So I think, uh, yeah, so this was some of our early transplant experiments. So go ahead and so oh. if, we, if we start a seed germinating in sand and then transplant it to sand after eight hours and then that little blue arrow is like you add the swimming zoospores, we were able, um, using qPCR analysis or quantitative polymerase chain reaction, um, we were able to quantify how many zoospores were on the seed, uh, like how many successfully arrived. And then we were able to say, okay, and then over the next nine days, what was the infection level, right? So uh, yeah, 0% stand at nine days, every single one damped off. Um, and so then- You're finding that much DNA. There? You're finding that much of the- bad guy, the pathogen DNA on the seed, and it's yeah. that, that's a total kill. But then in contrast, if you started the cucumber seeds in, I think it was a 10 or 20% vermicompost sand mix. Like and VC then is then vermicompost. You, yeah. <laughs> what was it? It was 20? V VC is vermicompost. Oh yeah, VC is vermicompost, not venture capital. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then, and then I, it was cool. I had this little mesh that I embedded them in. So I could lift up like all of them together and put them in the other funnel at the eight hour time point. And at that point, they, those seeds, there's no visible vermicompost on them, but they really had been colonized by, you know, that seed colonizing community um, that, that uh, was attracted to the exudates that those seeds were releasing over the first eight hours of germination. And then at that point, adding the zoospores, we had no detectable zoospores arriving on the surface of the seed um, at, at that 32 hour time point. So zero femtograms there. Um, and then you let it go for the rest of the nine day period and you had a 90% stand. So there was still a little bit of damping off, but wow, like 90% of your seed still alive is, is better than 0%. So yeah. yeah, it was kind of the core of those experiments. And, and what we found later, so the video that I showed earlier before Tom hopped on, um, we didn't know at that point what was happening. We had a couple of hypotheses that we were investigating. One, maybe there one of the microbes or multiple microbes in that seed colonizing community produced a repellent that repelled the zoospores. Or two, alternately, maybe those microbes consumed an attractant that the zoospores needed to find the seed. Um, and so we were kind of looking at both of those and it turned out to kind of be C, uh, something in that community was producing um, a biosurfactant and exploding the zoospores into tiny bits. So uh, we did a bunch of follow up. So based off of these bioassays, I then went in and collected everything within that matrix at the eight hour period and did a bunch of time point collection between the eight and 32 hours. And I was able to just pull that entire liquid that they were in, freeze dry it down, and then resuspend it and use it in microscopy assays with, with the zoospores. 
And what I started noticing, I'm like, well, I'm having trouble counting the zoospores in response to this, you know, exudate. Um, and I, they, they were literally like, they don't have a cell wall. They're very susceptible to surfactants because they just have a lipid bilayer and what, whatever surfactant was being produced. And again, we did some follow-up um, GCMS work and we worked with Metabolon, which is kind of a metabolomics company. Uh, they weren't able to like definitively ID it, but we, we do have the information from them in the paper that, uh, you know, we're not sure exactly what kind of a surfactant it was, but we know that it, it was a, like a surfactant. So um, yeah, so something... All you got to do, you, you know, you put the seed in there. You don't even need the vermicompost to be present. Just those microbes that hop onto that seed within eight hours effectively produced some compounds that uh, exploded the zoospores and left them in like very sad, just kind of scattered remains on the bottom of the microscope slide. So, um, yeah. Think about that, that. Just, just exposing the seed for eight hours to vermicompost gave it protection the rest of the time. So and these are viable microbes. So they've they're they've found a home on the seed surface. They're not they're not harming the seed, yet they're protecting the seed. Yeah, they're protecting the seed. Uh, and so, I know you did some follow-up like seed treatment work. I don't know if you can talk about any of that or if any of that had been published, but um, that's what kind of got us interested in, oh my goodness, like could you make a seed treatment out of any of this stuff? So yeah, these are just some of the early specimen images from like pulling those seedlings out of, of the bioassay setup. Um, I like to, so again, so just growing in soil or soil and vermicompost, you can already see the vermicompost is making them grow better. Yeah. <laughs> but then when they say inoculated, inoculated to a plant pathologist means giving it the disease. Not, yeah. so we inoculate not to get diseases, plant pathologists uh, inoculate to give them the disease. Kill all the that, things. That, that, so, that's yeah. a critical point to let everybody know. Yeah. So you can see, and so literally 50 milliliters of three times 10 to the fifth zoospores. So again, so if you inoculate them and it's just soil, you kill off 80%. You inoculate them and if they've grown in vermicompost, only 10% die is kind of the way to read this picture. Mm -hmm. And so we always like to show you see that a... it's reproducible year to year to year. And you can talk about sterilizing it though, Alex. Oh yeah, the reproducibility. And again, that's key, right? Um, right like this whole idea of consistency and and that's what's really plagued the whole disease suppressive compost world is okay you find one that's suppressive you put a bunch of it in a freezer to do a study you go back two years later to the same producer and it doesn't have the same phenotype so you know being able to even study these effectively like relies on someone producing consistent material so that you can go back again and again get multiple batches and like build up a bank of it so that you can even do the research over multiple years and follow on studies but yeah. we did but in here though with the, the batch really batch consistency part, right and, and here though what we found out that was so if you sterilized it by eating it we lost a lot of the disease suppressive properties of it yeah so if you know, either you're killing off the microbes, or you're damaging those biochemicals or whatever you're doing. Uh, so storage is, so for me as a producer, I don't want to let it get too hot in storage. Freezing it doesn't hurt it at all. By no, the way. freezing's fine. So 40 below, because this is Western New York, it gets 24 below anyhow, <laughs> you know, in the winter. But, uh, and again, and so inoculated here means given the diseases. So we lost our ability to suppress the disease, but- Can, can we say infected? Or what? Can we say infected? Well, not really, though. That's a good question, Peter, because if you look at the seedlings for batch one, batch two, and batch three, they're not infected. Like, they were inoculated, but they didn't get infected. So that's the subtle distinction of, like, I added the pathogen. I knew the pathogen was there. Did disease actually occur? Yes or no? And so then what I worked, as Allison alluded to earlier, we worked about three years to how to make an extract that had the same properties in terms of plant growth, but plant protection also as the vermicompost itself. So we went through some pretty involved processes. It, it, it's simple, but it, you know, to come up with the right, a, a consistent extract based upon, you know, so different vermicompost will behave differently. It's kind of the takeaway from there, but here you can really see the same thing. So the, uh, the extract produced the same efficacy as 
the vermicompost. But what was really neat here is, so you can sterile filter an extract, but you can't sterile filter a granular material. So basically we put the extract through a 8.22 micron. micron, yep. Yeah, we can literally filter out the microbes. So that's a sterile extract. Our sterile extract isn't suppressive. So here it wasn't due to heating it to sterilize it. This is literally, you take the, take the microbes out of our extract, you take away a lot of their ability to suppress the disease. So very much a, a smoking gun, so to speak. Dr. Tom? Yep. Go ahead. And I had a question. Back. You mentioned <laughs> Australia. Yes. And this goes back at least 10 years when I was just beginning doing some reading on vermicomposting. I think I read something about a system that had been developed in Australia using air in the substrate to keep for aeration levels or oxygen levels in the substrate. Does that ring a bell to you? Well, uh, I, I don't recall that paper, but yeah, it's very important. You know, the, the worms are aerobic creatures, so they they have to absorb oxygen. You know, they're mu they don't have lungs. They have a mucus layer on their outside, and they have to be able to absorb oxygen by you know osmosis and diffusion into that mucus layers. So if your substrate is waterlogged, so if your worm bed is too wet, it'll go anoxic, right? So the microbes will consume the oxygen. Anoxic means no oxygen in it. And therefore you will now suffocate your worms. So yes, it is very important to have a oxygen saturated media for the worms to live in. Now, some people, I, I've seen many people will put aeration tubes inside a worm bed because uh, it is hard to do that balancing act. Your water, you're adding all this water to keep them moist because again, they, they need water. But if you add too much water, you fill up all your pore spaces with the water and it'll go anoxic. So if you can't get your water budget right by applying it, I've seen people try to counteract that by making sure that they will aerate their worm bins. Uh, I blew air up to the bottom of my worm bins in New York. We don't do it down in Mexico, but that's more to dry it. Uh, at the bottom, one way to make sure your worms stay where you want them in the worm bin is they don't like to be dry. <laughs> so if you make the bottom of your worm bin really dry, they won't go down. They'll always stay up. Uh, we've done the whole sequence. You know, we did the whole 10,000 species at Cornell with, uh, with Jenny Cow Niffin. Uh, I think I saw this paper. I didn't know it was your material. That's awesome. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 And so one of the neat things we can kind of, you know, just on a, a simple uh, richness basis is uh, compost has the lowest richness, manure had the middle richness, and vermicompost was the most rich, which isn't surprising. So, you know, so what, this is the fallacy of when sometimes there are some organizations out here that just count microbes, count numbers of microbes. So you will get a lot of microbes in compost, in a thermophilic compost, but you do not get richness because there aren't that many microbes that live at 145 degrees by species. Meanwhile, in a nice mesophilic thermophilic, a nice mesophilic vermicompost, we can have lots of different kinds of microbes. Now, and again, inside the cow gut raw manure, these are probably all anaerobic microbes. Mm -hmm. So again, you gotta be, this idea that counting microbes is like counting pounds of nitrogen is just, it's a dead end. You got to be very careful about it because, you know, out of the 99% of the microbes probably have no impact on plant growth or plant protection. They're just going about their happy little microbe life. We really want to kind of center on these microbes that are doing these important things for nutrient cycling, plant growth, and plant protection. So this whole idea, you know, we're not, uh, uh, so again, these are just some nice pretty pictures. So uh, if you're a vermicomposter, I highly recommend that you work with the Langrate universities because I don't ever want to show pictures of plants that I grew myself. It, it tends to be a little self-serving. So I used to always work with this, the New York facility, Cornell was our land grant school. Uh, I would work with Neil and Stephanie here. But again, it's not hokum. So if potting soil with no nutrients, 
4% of the media is vermicompost, 8% of the media is vermicompost, 12% of the media is vermicompost. I mean, you don't need a degree in horticulture. It works and it uh, makes nice plants. Tom, uh, someone in the chat asked for clarification. What is bacterial richness? Does he mean diversity? Yeah, it, it, that's kind of, Allison, you uh, probably- Species richness. It's, yeah, it's probably defined as species richness from a, a 16X, a 16S metagenomic data set. So it, it's basically diversity. There are a lot of different metrics. There's like the Shannon index and the, you know, if you ask microbial ecologists, there are like 10 different ways to measure diversity, but uh, richness is one of them. So it, right. You, there's just too many to start trying to actually if you try to do the genus and species of every bacteria in there, it just goes crazy. And one of the things that we always have to realize is there is no database for fungi yet. So almost all of this, you know, microbial work that's been done is just bacteria based. There's the, we're just, we're, we're at the, the start of the learning curve on, on all the funguses. And we know the fungi have lots of very important metabolic functions mm -hmm. in, in the cycling here. So. You know, it's, it's a great time to be in the field. It's frustrating the fact that we want to have answers, but it's just not prescriptive yet. It's not like saying 120 pounds of nitrogen gives you 150 bushel an acre corn. We can't say that 34 bacillus subtilis give you, you know, 120 bushel an acre corn. We're just, we're getting there, but we're not there yet. So showing pepper plants behave like tomato plants. And then using the extract, this is the number of extract applications. You know, Neil's a floriculture, so I always have to throw a couple flowers in there with them too. <laughs> and uh, what we really found that most of our growers um, liked to do was, um, you know, vermicompost can't make up the full fertility for the plant. Uh, so they used to like to combine vermicomposts with other biostimulants and other organic fertilizers. So we used to say that, uh, you know, we became a part of a fertility program for a grower rather than trying to say that we're the entire fertility program for a grower. Because the vermicompost component is more like the yogurt. <laughs> you know, we've got all these nice, you know, microbial and microbial metabolites in there, but you probably want to combine it with other richer sources of fertility and things. So basically using some uh, organic fertilizers, because those were our bread and butters, uh, you know, some chicken meal materials. And then also you hear a lot about the biostimulants and the humic acids. So this was comparing them to that. So one of the amazing things that kind of went throughout our, our trial on here was if you used, so just fertilizer, but you used the, the extract, you could basically cut your fertilizer use in half. You could get the similar yield with using half the fertilizer if you just added a little bit of the extract with it, the vermicompost extract, which is really low. I mean, it's like 80 parts per million on a, on a for nitrate. But what it really, what our our hypothesis right now, and Neil and uh, even Anu at Cornell, these microbes are normally used to doing the nutrient cycling. So your the microbes are there. You give them the nutrients. They're consuming them and then their metabolic byproducts are the form of the nutrients that are available to the plants. And yeah, Tom, didn't Anu do some mixtures of the vermicompost with blood meal? Like she did some really nice, like, yeah. Cabbages, right, some really good work with cabbages. And so, you know, what we used to say is, you know, plants don't have mouths, they have straws. So, you know, feeding a plant isn't, you know, you, you can only absorb water soluble form of the micro and macronutrients. And so really one of the great things that the, you know, the vermicompost community is doing here is we're, we're transferring what are, you know, we know these parameters, calcium, magnesium, nitrogen, phosphorus, you know, whatever, micro and macro, they're in the, the potting media, but the plant can't eat it. It's got to get turned into a soluble form that the plant can now suck through their roots. And so by using, you know, using a nice organic fertilizer and then kind of inoculating it with the extract, you're, you're making that natural nutrient cycling happening without having to feed the plant so much fertilizer that eventually it just absorbs some. But this, this idea that a little bit of extract always, it was always almost exactly 
you could cut the fertility use in half just by using a little extra. So we were always like showing, you know, and, and why one of the physical things we always notice in vermicompost plants, they have a lot more roots. It just really makes the roots grow. And you can just imagine that this plant here on the right, that's going to absorb nutrients and water from a larger soil volume than this plant, right? So vermicompost, we have strawberry growers that said it reduced their water use. Well, I had a hard time figuring out how can a plant use less water just by using vermicompost? But then you start thinking about it. If the plant has a bigger root ball, it's going to be able to draw water from a larger area more efficiently than here. It can only grab it when the water is moving right down and it better hit a root for it to grab it. Well, and this is just some pretty pictures of us being used in really large scale applications. So this is a soil blender. Uh, this is in California. This is top three tomato grower in the, he grows 450 million tomato plants a year. 1.2 plants per American. And so usually in, inside a greenhouse, this is Elzinga. So either uh, in a greenhouse, they sometimes will blend their own soil or large soil blenders. There's a lot of things that go into potting soil. And in some cases, it's our material. Material is put in, they load up, up into the little cells. The cells get dibbler, my favorite piece of mechanical apparatus in the world, a dibbler. The seeds are put in. And then, so this is the goal. When you're in commercial horticulture, you know, you want to see a little plant in every hole, in every center of everything. And, in, you know, in the cannabis world, you know, you're talking about a dollar a seed. You know, you don't want to see too many, like here's a blank right here, right? You know, but in general, you want to see nice uniform germination, you know, and uniform height. So that these plants are plants you can all take care of. Uh, this is a grower in Michigan who has biocontrol. So these are parasitic wasps that he puts in the middle of his trays. Uh, it's usually top dressed, put in a humidity controlled room brought into the greenhouse. These are all herbs. This is cilantro and parsley. And so again, right when they germinate and just realize at the beginning, the seed doesn't really need any fertility. You know, the seed is, it's like the yolk and an egg. It's got, it's all that's, that it needs. But moisture management is key. Uh, vermicompost helps out on that. And then as they're growing now fertility, it can start absorbing it. The, 3% vermicompost that we had in the media, and now they're also irrigating with the vermicompost. But remember, they don't want a lot of fertility. You don't want the plant, just like in cannabis, you don't want it to stretch. You don't want a leggy plant. Mm -hmm. you, know, you want too less, right? Right. Early growth, you want it all in the roots. So again, the nice part here is we had a very easy time converting. These were not growers that are were used to adopting to organic practices, but Instead of using blue water in their fertigation system, just use brown water. <laughs> and they would actually wind up going back and forth. So if they were fertigating three times a week, so, oh, fertigation is half fertility irrigation, fertigation. So they would do two applications of the extract and one application of the high nutrient solution. Uh, we used to deliver it to them in here. So this is our extract in their tanks. Uh, so these are, oh, and I'm getting late for my meetings. Uh, so this is 2 million broccoli plugs on one bench. That's what 2 million broccoli plants look like on one bench. Uh, and this is what it looks like. And so when these guys, they grow them, they are scheduled for delivery on, you know, Tuesday, March 14th at two o'clock. These plants need to be ready because the grower has got, he's got the equipment out in his field. He's got his Plant, you know, he's got his people doing the planting. So this is, you know, when they talk about precision agriculture, these plants all have to be ready. And this is exactly what he wants. He doesn't really care what it looks like above the ground, but that's a really good root ball. That can take now going from the flat out into the field. And so traditionally what's done is plugs are transplanted in the field with something like a water wheel planter. You know, it pokes, they grow the plant. Uh, we, used to, we have our extract also in these tanks that we put up. Uh, you can have two row, four rows. There's lots of different ways to do it. Uh, 
This is uh, King City, California. Uh, this is just uh, outside of San Luis Obispo. And you can see that now your poor little plug plant, it's got to survive out in these, it's, it's 106 degrees. And it's transplanted out there. Now it's got to fight for its rest of its life. But uh, it's an excellent use for the extract. And that is not good soil right there, but uh, it grows nice plants. So uh, I just like to say it's taken a lot of, you know, I get to make all these pretty pictures and people think I'm the rock star, but it takes a lot of people to work with me. So these are, these two guys right here worked for eight months for no pay to have me keep the facility going at one point. They're some very good friends and these are my good friends down in Torreon, Mexico as well. Okay. I, um, I think I took that picture on the lower right, for real. <laughs> that, uh, that was the day we closed on our funding. I, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. but uh, yeah, it's, uh, so I'd just like to say it's large scale vermicomposting, it really works, you know, and uh, it makes a real product for real people. So now I'm, I need to relinquish my control. How do I do that? Stop sharing, okay, there. I, I hope I, I know I talk fast, I'm from New York <laughs> and that was a lot, but uh, I'm, Unfortunately, that, that really is all the time I, I, I've got. Well, I can take a couple of questions. I got I got 13 minutes. Hey, all right. Before you go, the, the chat room is absolutely blowing up, begging you for a worm joke. Can we get a worm <laughs> oh, joke? Oh, yeah. We need a bad worm joke, Tom. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I, you got 13 I minutes. Of, I, I have a couple of them, but most of them involve shitty. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I can't come up with one right now. I'm, I, I was in academic mode, not not, not my comedian mode. I'm trying Are there to, any question, questions? I should questions? know most of them by this oh, point. Like, I do. I just, uh, you know. I, I, had, I had asked a question earlier, and Allison deferred me to you, and here you are. So um, I was curious, the chat room's also curious about the ideal ratio of like bedding to food stock when running a, a vermicompost system. <clears throat> So there are rules of thumb that people use. So, you know, for every pound of worms you have, you can feed them somewhere between a tenth of a pound a day and three quarters of a pound a day. Uh, it's very hard to, you know, so I, I used to do worm density studies. Uh, once a week, I would come through with a coffee can, you know, and you would, then you bring it back in, you sort out the worms from the and you weigh them. And so then you can extrapolate. Uh, but really, part of your worm husbandry really has to be looking. You can't feed until the worms have eaten what you've already fed them, because we call it the death spiral. So if you get if you get locked into a schedule that you think you know, um, if you put down more food than the worms eat and then you bury it, now it's going to go thermophilic. Comp it's going to start to heat up, and then the worms don't like it. They leave that area, and of course the worms are what are doing the stabilization. And so they leave. So now it's not, now it's really undigested food that sits there and you get the negative feedback loop and it'll get hot. And then eventually the worms will vote with their feet and you haven't seen a mess till you've got a hundred thousand worms on the wall. And it, it is, it is a powerful smell when worms die. And I, I work with manure and composting for a living. And when proteins decompose, I mean, it, I, I wrecked a company car once. It was like the Seinfeld episode. I had a one pound bag of worms that I forgot. I left it in the back of the car over the weekend. And it's that car smelled for a year. People used to come back when they get it from the carpool and punch me in the shoulder. There, there's my joke. And that's not a joke, it's a true story. <laughs> so uh, yes, you know, really you gotta watch the worms. You know, you, you, you take your cue from them. Uh, and again, they, you know, there's people like to, you know, who's doing more, you know, how many pounds of worms they have per square foot. There, there's a lot of garbage information on the internet. Garbage. Uh, you know, or maybe they were able to maintain that level of worm population for like three days out of the year. Uh, that's not how you build a business model or really run a facility. You know, figure out what your average is and right in different times of the year, they behave differently. I don't know how they, you know, I, I keep them in a fairly climate controlled building. Reproduction happens all year long, but there's twice a year when they go crazy. I don't know, they, 
they're signaling in some, some circadian rhythm is signaling into them. Okay. Got another one? Oh, there are probably like a million. Do you have any more questions for Tom? What other ones did we defer until you got here? Uh, oh, um, has anyone done like a head-to-head -head quality assessment of different types of composting worms or vermicomposting worms and then the quality of their material? And I think Jim was specifically asking about the blues, like the Malaysian blues. The Malaysian blues or the uh, Hawaiian blues. Yeah, so uh, at different temperatures, I've seen a couple of papers where, so those tend to be the tropicals. Sometimes they call them Indian blues too. Uh, they do better at higher temperatures than the Icenia fetida and the perionics. Um, but then the quality, you know, uh, you know, what do you measure in terms of vermicompost quality? I get, I get that asked all the time and it's like, uh, you know, because different plants respond differently to vermicompost and are you looking, is the plant a height, like if you're cannabis, you, you really want, you know, they're a heavy feeder, you know, that, that's a plant that wants a lot of nitrogen, it's a tomato, so it was, I, I worked in, um, uh, outside of Medford, Oregon for nine months, two years ago with, with the cannabis world and uh, you know, it it really behaves. It, you know, you can read any paper built on tomatoes and substitute cannabis if you want to. Uh, in terms of the fertility program, especially. Uh, so, one of the ways I tell good vermicompost from bad vermicompost is solubility. If you're if you're a grower and you're buying vermicompost, see how much of it you can get dissolved into. You know, because if it's not worm work, it doesn't dissolve. I've got some great pictures of people that were selling vermicompost. You put it in a glass, it goes right to the bottom and just sits there. Is there a oh, particular ratio you that. use when you do that? Is like so much vermicompost to so much water? Uh, so with a really good vermicompost, we were shooting for roughly 40 to 1. We wanted to kind of, so, which was a simple way of saying that one pound made, made 40, Right. Uh, 40 to 1 on a mass to mass ratio. Yeah, I think, yeah, it was 40 to 1. Yeah. But hey, I, in vermicompost, I had to go up to, I had to go down to like 20 to 1 because it wasn't as soluble. And then some go down to 5 to 1. So when I say to 1, the 1 is vermicompost. So 40 to 1 is 40 parts water to 1 part vermicompost. If you have a lower quality vermicompost, you might have to only be five parts water to one part vermicompost. Hey, Tom. Get to these ratios. Oh, go ahead. In the days before legalization or decriminalization, whatever, the grow stars would have a sign in there that you couldn't mention cannabis or you'd be asked to leave. And so it became a running joke that you would talk about tomatoes. Right. And you, you thought you were in Palermo or something, uh, talking with a bunch of uh, tomato farmers. Uh, but yeah, you know, well, I've got cherry tomatoes, but I don't have the beef steak, you know, that kind of, it was just, it yeah, was, right, and you mentioned right. that it brought me back 20 years ago. So. Well, yeah, and, uh, you know, academics, it was it was a death sentence. If you did any research uh, uh, on a cannabis plant, you would never, you would be disqualified from then participating in any federally funded research the rest of your career. So I have one important question on your, the science that you presented, and I think it would really be helpful to cannabis growers specifically, a dollar a seed would be a bargain. And so how can we take quality vermicompost, let's say we make it ourselves, how can, is there a way to take that material and then inoculate the seeds to prevent damp off and other issues after we put our expensive <laughs> seeds in our not so good soil. Right, and so I was talking about CBD varieties of cannabis. It's about a buck right, of right. is what we were dealing with in, uh, and that was last year. So um, yes, uh, so I, you know, I have only so many minutes in a day here, but yeah, we worked for three years. I made seed treatments out of vermicompost. So we, it, okay. it, it's a technology that works, you know, you got to, you know, you got to micronize it. You got to get it down almost to a talc, and then you got to figure out ways to get it to stick to the seed. But as Allison can tell you, 99% of all seed that's planted in the country is treated. Seed is treated. <laughs> so, you know, 
it's very, most people have never seen an untreated seed <laughs> unless they're eating a cucumber directly, you know, kind of a thing. Thank uh, you. So, I appreciate yeah, your help. It, yeah. it, it works. Uh, just find the right people. And I think I got one last question in me, then I got to go. Is there one more? No? There, there was a question about the priming effect. I don't necessarily understand the question, but the priming effect and what microbes might contribute to that. I'm not really sure what prime, but you know, again, so we uh, we thought of vermicompost like in potting soils, which are very sterile, right? You know, that's what they want to do. They don't want to risk bringing anything into the greenhouse, or you know, you, everything's autoclave. That uh, while that's nice, it doesn't. The plant wants to have a, you know, it needs to have that rhizospheric community. It needs to have a microbial community around its roots, and around its leaves, and around the seed. So one of the things you can do is now with a vermicompost that's gone through a process that has pasteurized like we did when we went through a little composting before it. So now it was basically pasteurized and then the only thing we inoculated it with was what we would consider safe microbes from the vermicomposting process. So now this is like a yogurt, it's a prime. So now when you give me a potting soil or a soil that's like from disturbed earth or intensive agricultural use, you can think of vermicompost as a way to kind of put that yogurt macrobiotic back into either a soil or a soilless media safely. You're not putting a raw organic in there, which can be safe. Most of the time raw organics are safe, but they have the potential to not be safe. And so, you know, we're all living in a microbes world. We're just co-inhabiting it with them. So, and with that, I'm going to have to sign off and it was a nice talk. Thank you to so much, Tom. This is great to have you on. And if I can get uh, Neil, I, I may like uh, ask you for an encore performance to talk about some of the horticulture stuff like in, in the following. A lot of the yeah. more vermicompost use and plant production type of stuff. Tom, we want yeah. more. We want more. The world wants more Tom Hurley. Thank yeah. you, Tom. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. That, that's not what my wife tells me, but that's <laughs> Say hi to Ellen. <laughs> All right, and so we have uh, someone new who joined us. Uh, Doug, you there? What? Hold on, we can't hear you. Uh, so on the bottom left, you should see something that's about your audio source, this little um, uh, audio icon, and you can pick. It's usually the issue. But while while Doug's looking for his audio, Jim, do you want to tee up Doug and uh, tell us who he is? You bet. Uh, I began reading information about vermicompost probably 12 years ago and then decided that I wanted to make some. So I got Craigslist online out and uh, I found a gentleman in my part of the world that sold worms and uh, fabricated some really nice worm bins out of plywood. He wasn't doing vermicompost per se, I don't think. Anyway, I was the first person that answered an ad on Craigslist and was the first one who went over there and put some money in his hand and buy some worms. And that began a long-term uh, friendship. And I started telling people about it and, you know, and later he, uh, began doing vermicompost on a large scale, or at least in my world, a large scale. And um, it's the only worm castings I would buy in this part of the world and nothing but uh, spectacular success. He's got over 40 years experience in this uh, area, including uh, time that he did worm uh, vermicomposting in Alaska of all places. So uh, you know he's 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 got some scratch in the game and um, I've never had anything but good uh, reports from people that would did business with him, whether it was buying worms or uh, vermicompost or even his worm bins and what have you. Just a really great guy, super guy. 
And with that, Doug, uh, did, did you see my text or my message just saying in the lower left uh, is an audio icon? And then if you tap on it, it should let you choose your microphone source. You can hear me, right? The little up arrow next to the icon more specifically, but. Uh, there we go. So anyway, while, while I'll troubleshoot with Doug, but um, some reflections on what uh, Tom was talking about. I, I wanted to add that I, I began following the worm power story pretty early on and it was a project done with, in conjunction with USDA for helping rural communities that had something to get rid of, agricultural waste, like we'll call it. And so this began for the dairy industry in uh, upstate New York. And the rate at which they grew, and he, uh, Tom mentioned uh, that they were bagging it in 40 pound bags. Some of those bags even reached the West Coast, if you can imagine that. That's a long way to haul uh bags of uh, worm castings and uh i used to go down to salem and pick them up and they were exceptional and extremely consistent it, one thing about worm power is that their material could easily be mixed or go into soil mixers where consistency is a big deal as you can imagine to get something that's going to go because usually it goes directly into pots not into bags and so when you're filling trays and what have you that's really an important uh consideration on how the material flows into the little cells some of them only maybe an inch in diameter so that was my experience with the actual worm power product product itself and then later as they grew and watching videos in conjunction with some of the research that now we know is Allison was involved, you know, at Cornell using the castings that came out of uh, worm power for their research. Okay, so uh, we lost Doug's video. Uh, We will. Do 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 you uh, can someone text me his or Aaron? Could do, do you have Doug's cell? Yeah. <clears throat> could could you that maybe call? Me. Can you call him and try to troubleshoot with him on the side? And actually, that this could be a good time. Um, I, I wanted to take a break and be, because it's either going to be one like eight hour YouTube video or a couple of shorter videos. So what I'm thinking of doing is killing the YouTube broadcast and then just starting it right back up. So everybody who's watching YouTube, uh, if you just refresh in like five minutes, we'll be back. Uh, so with that, I'm going to, I'm going to stop the broadcast and then just start it back up. So after this event, it's a couple of shorter videos rather than one long unruly video. So, uh, we'll be back shortly. <laughs> 